Okay. Good morning and welcome again to the ninth meeting of 2017 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I remind everyone please to make sure their mobile phones are on silent. No apologies have been received and the first item on the agenda is the Laser Misuse Vehicles Bill UK, which is UK Parliament legislation. This relates to the committee's consideration of a legislative consent memorandum lodged by Fergus Ewing, the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Economy and Connectivity. The LCM relates to the Laser Mis Misuse Vehicles Bill, currently being considered by the House of Commons. As the lead committee, we are required to reflect upon the memorandum and then consider whether we are content with its terms. We will report our findings to the Parliament. Now, Scottish parliamentary standing orders provide that an LCM should normally be lodged with the Scottish Parliaments two weeks after amendments relevant to that bill being tabled or agreed by the UK Parliament. However, in this ca case of this LCM, the Minister for Parliamentary Business has written to the presiding officer explaining why the Scottish Government was unable to meet this requirement. A copy of his letter is included within the committee papers. I'd like to welcome on from the Scottish Government, Hamza Youssef, the Minister for Transport and the Islands, Bertrand Dees, the Head of Road Safety Policy, and Stephen Rees, the Solicitor. I'd like to invite you, Minister, if I may, please to make a open, short opening statement on this, and then I'd like to move to questions from the committee. Minister. Uh, thank you, Convener. Can I first uh, thank this committee and your clerks for showing such uh, responsiveness in allowing uh, the LCM to progress as quickly as possible through Parliament to allow the final stages of the Laser Misuse Vehicles Bill in the UK Parliament on the 16th of April. Uh, the timetable of the LCM has been constrained at, frankly, either end of the process. At the first end, uh, the Minister for Parliamentary Business, as you say, convener wrote to you uh, on the 14th of March um, and the presiding officer to explain why it has not been possible to lodge an LCM in accordance with the Parliament Standing Orders timescale. Uh, at the other end of the process, DFT notified my officials on the 14th of March about their 16th of April timing, meaning that the LCM would need to be passed by the Scottish Parliament before the 16th of April. Due to the forthcoming recess, the plenary debate would take place on the 29th of March at latest, with committee report issued five working days prior. Uh, this government shares the UK government's uh, concern, if I take the actual bill itself, that there have been an increased number of reported incidents of the deliberate misuse of laser pointers with consequences which could have been fatal. You may recall that a man was jailed two years ago for shining a laser pen at a police helicopter flying over Glasgow in 2013. Uh, we support the provisions of the bill and for the UK government legislating on a pan-UK basis to address this transport safety issue. Uh, the legislative consent of the Scottish Parliament is required for Clause 1 of the amended bill. That's the offence of shining or directing a laser beam towards a vehicle, uh, because the wider definition of vehicle means that laser misuse will be an offence in some contexts where the creation of such an offence is not reserved, such as uh, in relation to carriages drawn by horses or other animals, motor vehicles, and bicycles being, a use, being used away from a road. Uh, that is uh, all I have to say, and I'm, of course, happy to answer any questions, Convener. Thank you, Minister. We have several questions. Uh, the first one is from Richard Lyle. Minister, um, I personally welcome this, and I know it's the legis legislation principally aimed at addressing the shining of laser pens or pointers at pilots of commercial aircraft, and will also criminalise the shining or directing of laser beams towards any vehicle used for travel by land, water, or air. Do, for the record, do you know what the range of fines are? You said that a chap was jailed. Uh, is there a, a range of fines, or is um, can you inform the committee of that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, just uh, we look at the the recent case that I referred to in my um, in my opening remarks. Uh, it was an offence under Article 225 of the Air Navigation Order, so that's obviously uh, to do with aviation. Um, you know, it, it's an it's a, it's, a, it's an offence to shine or direct a light in an aircraft which dazzles or distracts the pilot of the aircraft. Uh, the penalty for that offence is uh, for that offence is a fine of up to uh, two and a half thousand pounds. Um, but the, the offence, and I suppose the important part of this legislation, uh, the offence doesn't apply to other modes of transport. And this, uh, I think, is a very sensible provision, very sensible measure from the UK government. Um, 
if we didn't grant the LCM, of course, the other way of doing it would be pretty messy for us to have to unpick that, legislate for the devolved parts, while the UK government just legislates for the reserved parts, and it doesn't really make much sense. So I think uh, a pan-UK approach is a, a sensible one. Oh, I should have also said, sorry, uh, I'm being pointed out quite rightly, that um, uh, maximal penalties uh, are also, there's a possibility, of course, of an indictment of up to five years imprisonment. So you mentioned the fine, but uh, of course it can carry a hefty uh, imprisonment uh, as well. Thank you. The next question is Stuart Stevenson, followed by John Mason. Uh, thank you. I've got a number of small points. I'll ask them all at once, if I may, just to try and shorten things. Um, it, it, it relates to the carriages drawn by horses and other animals. Is it intended it also relates to horses when they are ridden? Because it would seem, because of course that's not a vehicle, but it would seem that the risk and the, the danger might be pretty much similar. I think I know the answer, but I'd like to hear it. Um, the other one is the, the bill is described as the laser misuse vehicles bill. Uh, but in your previous answer, Minister, you talked that you, you said it was actually a, a light that would distract. I take it you're indicating that it is not necessary that the light is produced by a laser for it to be caught by the provisions uh, of, uh, uh, of the, the bill. And I suppose the, the final point, which I suspect I know the answer to as well, uh, is are there any modes of transport, in other words, that are excluded, that are not intended to be caught by this? Um, Thank you. I always appreciate Mr. Stevenson's uh, questions, and uh, this is no different, especially when he already knows the answer to them uh, as well. Uh, on your answer later, but <laughs> I'm not if, you, if you could start I'm not, off with the I'm not with convinced the there'll, be, uh, there'll be high marks. Uh, I, I will do my best and I'll pass over to, of course, the legal expert, uh, Stephen Rees. Uh, in terms of the carriages uh, drawn by horse, he asked a question uh, around whether it would apply to just horses that are ridden. Uh, my understanding, though again, I will pass over to Stephen, is that it applies to vehicles only and therefore uh, it would have to be uh, with a carriage. Um, for the other questions, uh, if you don't mind, I will pass over to the legal uh, expert, uh, perhaps Stephen and then Bertrand, if he wishes to come in uh, on the other two questions as well. Uh, yes, I can confirm that the, uh, the uh, bill uh, only applies to uh, vehicles, um, any vehicle used for travel by land, water or air, and therefore my understanding is that it would not uh, uh, capture uh, horses uh, uh, being ridden without a carriage. Um, in relation to uh, the laser beam uh, issue, the bill um, uh, only uh, 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 applies to the shining of a laser beam towards a vehicle or to an air traffic control facility, but laser beam is defined as a beam of coherent light produced by a device of any kind. So, um, uh, and that's, so, it, it, so, so the, the, the use of the phrase coherent light, which in technical terms is generally only capable of being produced by a laser, to produce an intent, it's high energy, but there are other high energy beams that are produced that are not coherent light. But this is a, really a matter for the UK, and I just want to be clear here what, mm. it, what it said. I, I would personally suggest it would be appropriate to, uh, for it to cover other sources of uh, intense light that are not simply coherent, uh, such as arc lights, which are not coherent light, but are equal, equally intense under appropriate circumstances. Might be one for us to... Uh, take away and, and, and we can reflect on uh, on that one and potentially have a conversation with the UK government on it. You are going to give us your thoughts after this meeting. You, you will have to do it fairly quickly if we're mm. going to complete with the time scales. Sorry. Okay. I, I think we may be out of time by the time you've done that. So I'm going to move on to the next question, which is John Mason. If, thanks, Convener. Just really one point. Uh, on the width of the, the vehicles that are covered, um, I mean, I'm not really in favour of legislation, legislating on things where there's no problem. And, I mean, absolutely, totally support aircraft, motor vehicles, trains. I mean, I do wonder how much problem we've had with lasers and hovercraft, given that we've got very few hovercraft, and how much problem lasers are to submarines. And it, it, they could be in the surface, I accept that. 
Um, and I mean, actually, with, with cycling as well, I mean, do we actually need legislation covering all of these things? I think there's something around future proofing. And if I take this last point in particular, so I accept uh, hovercraft and submarines will be relatively minimal and won't see them uh, very often. But of course, our, our own government is committed to increasing the rates of cycling and uh, increase them. Uh, quite ambitiously, and uh, you know, I could perfectly envisage. Uh, for example, I took part in Pedal for Scotland last year, and a Pedal for Scotland, where uh, thousands of us chose to cycle from Glasgow uh, to Edinburgh, was uh, for the second year in a row. Um, there, there was uh, there was an attack on those who were cycling. There was tax that were left out uh, purposely to try to disrupt that cycling event. Many people punctured, injured. Some of them crashed. Uh, I saw some people crash actually in front of me because. Uh, of the tax that were laid down. So there was people deliberately out there to cause harm to cyclists. Now, uh, you know, to think that doesn't happen, it does. Now, I don't know if there's incidents specifically of cyclists being attacked by, by, by lasers, but could we see that in the future at an event like this, if we're going to be doing more of these events, which I hope uh, we do? We absolutely could. So let's future-proof uh, the legislation, I think, is, is the important point. I don't know if any of my colleagues wish to add anything else. To no, that's fair. That's, that's a fair <laughs> point, yeah. yeah. Um, um, uh, Jamie, uh, you're next, and then Fulton. If I could ask you to give focus questions, I, I, I'd appreciate that. Jamie. Uh, no problem, convener. I'll ask questions I don't know the answer to. That's all right. Uh, can I just clarify, uh, just, uh, uh, just a general overview? There already is legislation covering the shining of beams into aircraft, but this additional legislation is basically to cover everything else that has an, a, a motor in it. Yes. Yeah, that, that's helpful. And secondly, it's only to cover... Uh, use of laser where it has a demonstrable uh, negative consequence or it's being appropriately misused or inappropriately used is a better way of phrasing that. So it, in other words, it won't cover any existing uses of laser which are used against moving vehicles such as directing aircraft into docking areas or yeah. a, a, any other piece of technology where laser is used in the, in the direction of, of, uh, of vehicles. Uh, yes, yeah, so Steve, Stephen can come into it, but it is around the intention of, of dazzling and distracting, but uh, Stephen could probably uh, go into more detail. Yeah, that was really the point I was going to make, was that it is a requirement that the, um, the uh, laser dazzle or distract, or is likely to dazzle or distract, so legitimate uses um, presumably would not have that effect. The other aspect I would mention is that um, there, is a, there are defence provisions in the uh, bill um, where if the person has a reasonable excuse for shining or directing the laser towards the vehicle, or did not intend to shine or direct the laser towards the vehicle and exercised all due diligence and took all reasonable precautions to avoid doing so, then there's a defence to the, to the, to the, uh, the offence. So uh, presumably uh, that, that should capture legitimate uh, um, uses of... Okay, so, it, so if the perpetrator can demonstrate a, a legitimate use for making the action, it's unlikely they would be prosecuted in the sense that, for example, in, 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 uh, in sailing, one of the first things you learn is that get people's attention any way you can, and if that is a laser, then so be it, uh, uh, given that they're more common, commonly carried by people these days. So uh, yeah. I, I'd, I'd hate to think that th that use would be unintentionally captured. I, by I, th I think in that example, you would hope that the, the fiscal would not prosecute in the first instance, and if they did, there would be a defence uh, in, in the legislation that, that I think um, that individual could, could deploy. Thank you. Last question then from uh, Fulton McGregor. I mean, I'm just wondering if there's been any research done either by the Scottish Government or by the UK Government about exactly how many uh, charges there may be um, under uh, you know, you know, this offence, if, if it, for example, if it had been in place last year or whatever. Yeah. So obviously we have the, the law at the moment uh, on, in terms of Article 222, as I've already mentioned, in the air navigation side of things. So um, on, on that side, uh, I've just been passing some, some useful uh, statistics here on the convictions uh, that have taken uh, place since, since 2010. And, uh, you know, 2010, there was 26, 2011, 48. 27, 23, 21, 16, and 10, so diminishing, uh, of course. But there are, there has been, uh, as the uh, uh, as the statistics show, that uh, a number of people that have been convicted under that. So it is, it is a problem and, and is an issue. Anecdotally uh, speaking, I have spoken to a number of uh, airlines in my time, and they tell me that their pilots do report it, not often, frequently. I have to say, um, the smaller airlines, and I think of companies like Logan Air. 
uh, and others have said to me before that, again, their pilots um, have uh, unfortunately uh, been in a situation where they think somebody's been pointing a, a laser towards them. So, uh, anecdotally, I can certainly say that um, it's been raised with me, uh, and as I say, there have clearly been some convictions since uh, 2010. In terms of uh, actual research, uh, in terms of uh, how many have been done, uh, I'm not uh, sure that there has been. I'm just looking at um, records from the British Transport Police as well, so obviously they patrol our railways, uh, and they show that approximately there's been 85 incidents per year between 2011 and 2016. So uh, we've mentioned airlines, uh, British Transport Police obviously see it as, uh, as, a, as an issue too. So uh, I'm not convinced it's been necessarily uh, detailed uh, research into uh, to how wide uh, an issue and a problem it is, but certainly uh, the statistics that we do have uh, show that it is a problem. So. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Minister, and, and, and thank you to, to both your witnesses. I'm now going to ask the committee, are members content to recommend that the Parliament agree to the motion drafted by the Minister and approve the legislative consent motion? Yes. That is agreed. I'd now therefore like to briefly suspend the meeting to allow the panel to change over. Thank you. Uh, I'd now like to reconvene the meeting and we're going to move to agenda item two, which is the Ireland Scotland Bill. Today we're undertaking a stage two consideration of the Islands Bill. I'd like to welcome uh, back the Minister for Transport and Islands, Hamza Youssef, and his officials from the Scottish Government. Everyone should have with them a copy of the bill as introduced, the marshalled list of amendments that was published on Friday and the groupings of amendment which sets out the amendments in the order which they'll be debated. It may be helpful just to explain the procedure, albeit briefly. There will be one debate on each group of amendments. I will then call the member who lodged the first amendment in that group to speak to and move that amendment and speak to all other amendments in that group. I'll then call other members who have lodged amendments within that group. Members who have not lodged amendments in the group but wish to speak should indicate that by catching my attention in the usual way. If he has not spoken on the group, I would invite the Minister to contribute to the debate uh, just before I invite the member who moved the first amendment in the group to wind up. Following the debate on each group, I will check whether the member first who moved the first amendment in the group wishes to press it to a vote or to withdraw it. If they wish to press it, I'll put the question on that amendment. 
If a member wishes to withdraw their amendment after it has been moved, I will ask if any other member present objects to them doing so. If any other member present objects, I will put the question on that amendment. If any member does not want to move their amendment when called, they should say, not moved. Please note that any other member present may move such an amendment. If no one moves the amendment, I will immediately call the next amendment on the marshalled list. <coughs> Only committee members are allowed to vote, and voting in any division will be shown by uh, <coughs> raising of hands. I'd also remind members it's important that they keep their hands clearly raised until the clerks have recorded the vote. The committee is required to indicate formally that it has considered and agreed each section and schedule of the bill, and I will put a question on each section at the appropriate point. I have uh, a note that's saying that we aim to complete stage two today, but I doubt that may be possible, but we will see how we get on during the course of the debate. Uh, so I'm now going to move uh, straight to uh, the uh, uh, listing. And the first one is to discuss uh, the purpose of the Act. And I'm going to call amendment in the name of Colin Smith in a group on its own. Colin Smith to move and speak to amendment 28. Thank you very much, Convener. I'm conscious we, we have a number of amendments to get through today, so I'll keep my comments um, relatively brief, as uh, members are familiar with. Um, what is, is classed here as, as a purpose clause. A purpose clause is aimed to, to clarify and state the overall aims of the bill. This ensures, in my view, that the purpose of the bill is explicitly stated in law. Underpinning the purpose in law, I, I believe, captures the overall spirit of the bill rather than just a letter of the law and any individual clauses. And I think it also helps prevent the, the misinterpretation of passages or the, the dilution uh, of ambition over time. Island economies suffer because of geographical disadvantage uh, and distance from markets. I, I believe it must be the overall purpose of this bill to try to redress this disadvantage. Agreeing this clause at this early stage will help when considering the detail of the individual clauses throughout <coughs> um, this stage and future stages. And there are, of course, examples in other legislation of a purpose clause, uh, and I believe uh, a purpose clause will help strengthen this bill uh, and certainly not weaken it. So I'm happy to propose my amendment. Thank you. Um, John, you... you. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, I mean, as has been said, and as I said yesterday in the Chamber, I am in favour of purpose clauses, and I really I would like to see the government, or anyone who brings forward a bill, start off with a purpose clause and then write the rest of the bill. Mm -hmm. I think it is extremely difficult to come in a, at this stage, when the bill is there, a, to put in a purpose clause. But I still fundamentally think a purpose clause should be there. I think it guides the lawyers. I, th I don't think the lawyers like it particularly, but it, it, it forces them, as a, Mr. Smith has just said, to um, focus on the overall purpose. My specific problems with the wording of this, of this purpose are, are three. Firstly, the word create, which suggests it's, it's not there to start with. Um, so in some cases we are continuing or wanting to continue a sustainable island community. Uh, secondly, because it focuses purely on island communities, and as will be seen from my other amendments, um, I am in also interested in islands which don't have communities. Uh, and thirdly, because it focuses purely on the economy, uh, whereas I think we are looking at also at culture, uh, natural environment, and various other issues as well. Thank you. Um, Stuart, you were next. Uh, thank you, Convita. I, I understand and have sympathy with what uh, Colin Smith is trying to do, but... I think the effect of what's before us carries with it the risk of actually diluting the ambition uh, of the bill because it's simply saying to create sustainable island communities. Now, if we actually look at, uh, uh, for example, uh, 3.2, uh, which follows uh, where this amendment would go, um, what is said there is drawn more widely because it's br more broadly improving outcomes for island communities um, by carrying out a function of a public nature. In other words, it isn't simply about sustainable island communities. It might improve the outcomes for island communities in a way that isn't directly addressing sustainability. Now, that is the risk, I think, <laughs> in the particular formulation that Colin uh, Smith has brought forward that I, I, I think would, uh, uh, subject to what I hear in the discussion here, uh, would lead me not to support this in this instance, in this form. Thank you, Stuart. Peter. Uh, thank you, 
convener, uh, I'm minded not to support this. And, and although we did discuss this and, 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 and think it may be necessary at stage one, I do not feel it is necessary going forward. It's a bit like the bill that we just discussed and debated yesterday, the Force, force and Land Management Bill. Uh, if you put a purpose on the face of the bill, it can be actually limiting on the bill, and then it becomes too prescriptive. And for that reason, mainly, I would say I am I'm not in favour of this amendment. Thank you. Um, Mike. There shall be a Scottish Parliament. Scotland Act 1998. I like that, Donald Ewer. I think it's really important uh, to give us the flavour of a bill to have a purpose of the Act there. <coughs> and I think um, I'd like to commend Colin Smith for bringing this forward. Whether we have a debate whether this particular purpose of the Act is the right one or not, that's the advantage of discussing it now in stage two. Because I hear what John and Stuart have been saying, um, and the Minister's listening. If the Minister thinks that there is a better purpose of the Act, then he could bring forward an amendment to this at stage three, and we could look at this again as a parliament. But I think it's important, actually, to start off with this in stage two and say, let's support this, let's have it on the, on the face of the bill, because I think from our evidence that we were gathering in stage one, that um, Islanders, I certainly took from the evidence that we received, that they wanted some sort of purpose. There was something missing in the bill, and I think this is a good start. So I would be inclined to support Colin Smith's amendment. Thank you, Mike. Uh, John Finney. Yeah. Um, I'm supportive of uh, Colin's uh, amendment. I, I think that we could, and I suspect you wouldn't want us to spend all day discussing every word and every possible interpretation of it, but uh, I don't think there's anything in further. I, I suspect Collins uh, would confirm intended criticism in the word create, but we, we all know that we're far from the situation where any of our island communities are entirely sustainable. Um, and uh, uh, again, discussions around um, the, the word sustainable, well, I'm sure it will have due regard to the environment, to cultural and economic matters. And, you know, um, certainly the word build their economies, well, that in itself wouldn't ordinarily, in, uh, you know, win green support were it not for the, the, the preamble first about the creating sustainable, because it's not going to build it in any other way than an appropriate way if it's going to be sustainable in the first place. So for these reasons, I won't be supporting Colin's amendment. Thank you, John. Uh, Jamie Green. Thank you, Convener. Um, just to add to some of the previous comments briefly, uh, I, I feel strongly that the bill should have an objective. And I, I take that from the evidence that we heard uh, in speaking at many of the focus groups uh, from islanders themselves. So. These aren't really necessarily my words, but they are the words of people who, have, who we met throughout this journey and process. Now, whether these are the words that should be in it, I am minded to agree with Peter Chapman. I don't think this uh, is all-encompassing, but I think it's heading in the right direction. So whilst I won't support this amendment, I would like the Minister to reflect on the strength of view in the committee that there should be a purpose. I think the problem with this specific amendment is, for example, uninhabited islands that may not necessarily have economies or communities in the same way that inhabited islands have, and I wouldn't like them to be ruled out of any such. But there's nothing to disagree with in the words that Colin Smith uses here. I just feel it doesn't entirely encapsulate uh, the, the, the essence of the feeling of where this bill is heading. And I think there's general agreement of where this bill needs to be, to be going, but uh, how we encapsulate that in wording I think will be a difficult task to do, but I'm hopeful that the Minister can do that by stage three. <coughs> Thank you, Jamie. Uh, Minister. Uh, convener, can I say from the outset, and I'll speak to obviously a number of uh, amendments, that uh, where I can be helpful, uh, where we can reflect as a government, then absolutely we will, because we want to take this uh, islands bill forward uh, in, in, in the spirit that I think we started, which is to be as collaborative and consensual uh, as possible. In terms of uh, this specific uh, amendment, I do thank Mr Smith for articulating the reasoning behind uh, his amendment, and I also thank the other members uh, for some uh, very good uh, and insightful uh, reflections. Uh, I will, however, be asking the member to withdraw Amendment 28 today. Uh, while I can absolutely appreciate the intent to which Colin spoke to and other members spoke to, uh, I can't agree that this is necessarily the best way to achieve the aims and the outcomes he desires. In my position, 
as a minister, I, of course, have a responsibility to ensure that the law we make is good law. Of course, that is a responsibility uh, for all of us, a law which is capable of being put uh, into effect. I believe that, as I say, is a responsibility uh, for all of us. It's not a, a partisan issue. It's not an ideological position, uh, but our position as lawmakers. Uh, while there is a place for a, a purpose section in some bills, it is for a specific reason and to achieve specific legal effect. Uh, the creation of an overall standalone purpose for this bill uh, would be problematic. All the sections of a bill must have legal effect and be able to be interpreted by a court. It's not clear how this specific amendment would be interpreted within each part of the bill. I thought Stuart Stevenson's point uh, was well made to that effect. It's hard to give specific examples as the whole process is uncertain. We cannot always anticipate the arguments that others might make. But as an example, uh, the marine development licensing regulations allow for an appeal of a decision in relation to a license as a sensible and necessary provision. Uh, will the appeals process have to take into account this purpose? How might those who have to consider such an appeal in relation to any decision be expected to interpret the, pur interpret the purpose in relation to their duty and responsibilities? Will a requirement to build economies tip the balance in favour of permitting a development, even when there are other considerations or concerns, such as the impact of the environment? So while the intention behind such a purpose is laudable, to pass it into legislation, I believe, risks unintended consequences and indeed um, unknown consequences. Um, yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Minister, for the intervention. Can I, can I just clarify your position on this then for, before we move to a vote? Are you saying that uh, you would not consider a stage three including a purpose of act, or that you would, but just not these words? Because I think that may help where we're going with Mr. Smith's amendment. Yeah, I, I will come back to that. I'm just getting on to that very, very point, but uh, I have a problem with uh, the purpose on the face of a bill, but I do think we can try to get to where Mr. Smith and other members have articulated they want to get to uh, through other means, and I'll just come to that point uh, just now. So while, I, again, I say the, the intention behind such a purpose is uh, clearly laudable, uh, uh, for me, overall, this amendment imports a set of, of legal risks that we do not need. And I, of course, would welcome Mr uh, Smith's view on that in his closing. Uh, after the committee report and stage one debate, I made it clear that I saw a potential uh, for compromise that the committee wanted to achieve. My amendments one and two, which we'll talk about in more detail, of course, when that group comes around, uh, provide that the National Islands Plan will have a specific purpose of setting the objectives and strategy of improving outcomes for island communities, and will include the three underpinning objectives, uh, objectives listed uh, in my amendment too. That is, namely, sustainable economic development, health and well-being, and community empowerment. Uh, that encapsulates the spirit of Amendment 28 to Jamie Green's point, and will ensure that through the delivery of the plan, the aims of the member are met. I am, of course, always willing to discuss with the member, or indeed with other members, how we can improve the bill. I'll be happy to continue this conversation uh, in the lead up to stage three. Uh, I would therefore ask that the member withdraw his amendment, and should he press his amendment, I ask the members vote against it. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Colin, would you like to wind up, please, and press or withdraw your amendment, please? Um, thank, thank you very much, convener. I mean, I agree very much with the point that John Mason makes that, that a purpose clause should be um, put forward at as early a stage as possible. Um, I, I don't have any control, obviously, over what the, the draft bill says, but the earliest uh, this committee uh, and me as a, a member can put forward a, a purpose clause is, of course, at this, this stage here, and I think that's why um, I've put that, that forward um, today. Um, I, I think um, Mike Rumbles makes a very important point about we could put forward this amendment today, and if members um, are unhappy with the specific wording, of the, the purpose clause, then that can, of course, be amended at stage three. Um, I don't I have to say accept fully the argument that a carefully worded purpose clause, um, you know, cannot complement the, the rest of a bill. It, it certainly doesn't undermine it, and I think that's that's in the wording um, would allow that to happen. Um, I'm, I'm kind of conscious we seem to be having a, a case of déjà vu again when it came to the forestry bill. I wasn't here, but the forestry bill we had a similar debate in which a purpose clause was put forward and members expressed concern about the specific wording, uh, with a view to 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 amend in that word at a later stage. Um, I'm tempted to go down that route again and, and not, not press my amendment, but that would be on the basis of hopefully that members can come together and agree uh, a word in for a purpose clause that would be put in at stage um, three. So at this point, I won't, I won't press the amendment, uh, but hopefully that, that the message that it would be helpful to, to work on the word in uh, going forward for, for, for an amendment at stage three. 
Thank you. Uh, does any other member present object to the amendment being withdrawn? No. Uh, therefore, we'll move straight on to the next am uh, amendment. Before I do, though, uh, I have to ask, uh, sorry, the question is that Section 1 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I therefore, call Amendment 10 in the name of Liam MacArthur, grouped with the amendments as shown in the briefings. Liam Mac MacArthur, to move Amendment 10 and speak to all other amendments in the group, please. Thank you very much, Camille. Can I start by welcoming the work of the committee on this bill and, and in particular thank um, yourself and colleagues for taking the time to come up to, uh, to Orkney to hear directly from those affected, uh, both from my own constituency and that of Tavis Scott. I very much appreciate that. Um, you'll be delighted to hear uh, that last summer I managed to visit Ouskri, uh, one of the smallest islands up in the northeast of my constituency, where I met Simon Brogan, who, along with his partner Theresa Probert, are the sole inhabitants of that island now that their sons Rory, Hamish and Owen have left home. That just leaves Gersey as the only inhabited island in Orkney that I've yet to visit, and I intend to rectify that, weather permitting, uh, sometime later on this year. And while the needs of these um, uh, island communities, some of them exceptionally uh, fragile, are the focus of many of the amendments we'll be considering through the course of this morning, we can't lose sight of the importance of our uninhabited islands uh, also. Orkney has around 80 islands, of which um, just under 20 are inhabited, but all 80 play a crucial role in making Orkney the unique place uh, that it is, uh, not least in sustaining bird populations of global uh, significance. My amendment 10 addresses, I think, a weakness in the bill as it currently stands by making explicit the recognition of our uninhabited islands and their importance in the context of our efforts to promote biodiversity uh, and provide species protection. The amendment, I hope, reflects the committee's own conclusion at stage one that uninhabited islands have a, quote, cultural, environmental and economic significance that deserves to be fully reflected in this bill. And I know John Mason's uh, amendments drive at much the same objective, and I look forward to hearing what John uh, has to say, as well as the contributions for the ministers and other colleagues. But for now, I have pleasure in moving Amendment 10 in my name. Yeah, and I'd like to call John Mason to speak to Amendment 30 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. And um, yes, I think some of my thinking was in line with what uh, Liam MacArthur has just said. Um, so they're, they're really a package and they're all doing effectively the same thing. So, for example, in Section 3, uh, Subsection 2, where it says that uh, this is in relation to the island's plan, that uh, Scottish ministers in relation to improving outcomes for island communities, uh, the addition of my a amendment would say improving outcomes for islands and island communities, uh, therefore suggesting that islands have a value in themselves uh, as well as actually the people uh, that live on them. I mean, this is called an islands bill, yet almost exclusively it does deal with island communities. And absolutely, I agree that the communities are the number one thing, the most important thing uh, in relation to any island. Uh, but we do have islands, and we've had some examples in Orkney, uh, but I suppose the one that I'm most um, interested in is St Kilda, which are officially uninhabited, albeit the military and the National Trust uh, obviously have a presence there. Um, but they are of huge importance, uh, both in regards to wildlife, the environment, uh, and I think our whole history as a country and our culture, and the whole story of St Kilda, how the population struggled and was evacuated in 1930. Uh, so I do think uninhabited islands should be referred to in the bill, and, and that would be my key point. Uh, Liam MacArthur's Amendment 10, I have to say, is gentler than mine, and I don't know if that's common for the uh, government member to be taking a more extreme line than the opposition. Uh, he, he, his says it may, may include a single uninhabited island, which I feel is quite, uh, I'll not say weak, but uh, at least is gentler. Uh, it's certainly not very compulsory. And also it talks about contributing to the natural or cultural heritage or economy of an inhabited island. I suppose I've got some reservations about that because, again, I think islands like St Kilda, and I think probably others as well, have a value in themselves, not just in relation to another inhabited island. And I suppose I would have to accept, although that may be a weakness on my side of things, that um, some uninhabited islands are, are, do have a link more to the mainland, but are still important uh, in their own rights. Um, St Kilda, however, I, I accept would be included in this because I think its most strong links have been to the Western Isles and to Skye uh, traditionally. 
So I'm happy to listen to what other members might have to say on this, I'm happy to listen to what the Minister says on this, uh, but my, bot my bottom line would be I, I would like to see in the Bill somewhere mention of uninhabited islands. Thank you. Thank you, uh, John. Uh, Stuart, you'd like to... <clears throat> uh, uh, thank you. Just uh, in 1930, of course, uh, Hirta, which is the only inhabited part of the Golden Group, was actually part of Inverness, right? rather than the Western Isles. But that's history and doesn't matter. Um, the, 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 the Amendment 10 in um, Liam MacArthur's name, um, I, I think, does capture something quite important. Um, I will say, however, that uh, if we choose to pass it now, we may want to revisit the wording a little bit, and I'm not concerned about the use of the word may. And my specific issue is um, uninhabited islands, etc., etc., and associated ecosystems which contribute to the economy of an inhabited island. Now, I could make the argument, if I wished to, that Australia or an uninhabited island off the coast of Australia, by the climate change issue, contributes to the natural curative heritage and economy of an uninhabited island in Scotland. Now, I don't think we're actually trying to capture um, that as part of what we're trying to legislate here. But I'm content with the generality of where this uh, uh, amendment is trying to take us. But we might, we might have to look at whether that is actually what we mean, which I don't think it is, uh, and, and perhaps uh, tweak tweet this amendment stage through if Liam MacArthur successfully parades the committee now or brings it back in a modified form. That's a matter for, uh, for him. Now, it, it, turning to uh, John Mason's uh, plethora uh, of amendments, all of which address exactly the same point, uh, I've just got a very simple issue with what he's trying to do, uh, the words he's using. I don't know what an outcome for an island is. I just don't know what it means. I know what an outcome for people on an island can mean, but I don't, an island has no personality in a legal sense. It has no, uh, I just don't know what it means. And, and I think there is, there is a danger in putting it in there um, that, that, that we dilute the importance of what we're focusing on in uh, 3.2 et al, uh, when we focus on island communities. I think. You know, we really are trying to legislate in this bill to make lives better for the people who are on islands. That is the core purpose. Um, we've just had the discussion of Purpose Act, uh, which properly said island communities in the purpose, albeit we're not proceeding with that yet. And I think there is a danger. Yes, he will. I mean, would you accept that for an uninhabited island, having a community on it would be a positive outcome? Uh, yes, but I'm not sure that's an outcome for the island. That's an outcome for the community that would then be on an island. But I'm, 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 I'm conflicted on this because, to be quite straightforward about it, I just think the formulation that uh, Mr Mason has brought forward is not one until I'm persuaded that I should do so that I feel inclined to support. To, uh, Peter Chapman, followed by Rich Lowe. Uh, thank you, Convener. I do agree with Liam MacArthur's Amendment 10, as I think it's important that uninhabited islands are referred to in the key definitions of this bill. In sections 1 and 2 of the bill, we speak about an island, we speak about inhabited islands, and we speak about island communities, uh, but there's no reference to uninhabited islands, and, and I think it's important that there should be, because as we've already heard, uninhabited islands, uh, although they have no constituents, they still have natural heritage and cultural heritage uh, that needs to be respected. Uh, also, some smaller uninhabited islands may be neighbours to larger inhabited islands with fishing interests, for instance, which would require them to be mentioned uh, also. So, uh, Amendment 10 I support, and we al I also support uh, John Mason's list of uh, amendments, which are mainly technical in nature, but I think they are, they are correct, and I would, would support the whole, the whole gamut of uh, amendments in this section. Thank you. Um, Richard. Yeah, thank you, um, I'm tended to support Liam MacArthur's uh, amendment. Uh, in regard to John Mason's, um, basically I would ask John to withdraw them and discuss with the Minister. I, I don't doubt his enthusiasm with the amendments and uh, 
as he knows the definition of an island is, an, is land surrounded in all sides by the sea. Um, but he said uh, amendments would uh, bring in every piece of rock that's above water at high tide, and that seems a bit of a large expansion. I would suggest that he uh, possibly wishes to withdraw and discuss with the Minister for Stage 3. I'll support Liam MacArthur's, but won't not support Mr Mason. I've finished. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll bring John in very briefly, and then I'm going to come to the minister. So, John, sorry. Thank you very much. Well, I certainly support uh, Liam MacArthur's amendment, and uh, speaking to uh, John Masonson, I think we can dance around, and I appreciate that lawyers will tour forever over the world, but there can be outcomes for islands that are uh, uninhabited. Of course there can be. There can be positive environmental out outcomes which have wider uh, ramifications, so I'll be supportive of that, Very to press it. Thank, thank you, John. I'm now going to come to the minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. I welcome uh, the opportunity to speak to this group on uninhabited islands and appreciate that it become an issue of significance uh, for many. Uh, the focus of this bill is on improving outcomes for people, uh, those who live and work on islands. Uh, the 90 uh, inhabited islands in the seas around Scotland, of course, the three uh, inland islands not uh, covered. However, I, I was always keen to stress that this did not exclude the importance of other islands, uh, which are uninhabited, but which are important features of Scotland's natural and cu cultural heritage. Um, the two that have often been mentioned, uh, I think even today, have been St Kilda. As an obvious example, of course, the, uh, Ailsa Craig, uh, whose fame, uh, claim to fame is in relation uh, to curling stones. Uh, to that effect, there is nothing to prevent the National Islands Plan making reference to and provision for uninhabited islands. However, there are also instances when a group of islands in close proximity, some inhabited, some not, can have an interdependence or indeed a linked interest. Uh, that acknowledgement means that Liam MacArthur's Amendment 10 is very worthy of consideration. Uh, for that reason, I'd be happy to support Amendment 10. I do, however, have a technical concern about the amendment and how easily understood Section 2 would be in the bill if the Amendment 10 was inserted in its current form. I think Stuart Stevenson also referenced some of the uh, issues around perhaps the wording. Section 2 uh, does have a particular structure and we'd be adding four lines uh, to it which don't seem to fit. So I'd be happy to work with the member and perhaps he can work with uh, our legal team in terms of wording uh, on that, but notwithstanding that, I'm more than happy to support what I think is a very worthy uh, amendment. Uh, I'm hoping in support of uh, amendment in supporting Amendment 10, then there shouldn't really be a need for John Mason to necessarily press uh, his amendments. Um, so I'm hoping uh, he will withdraw. I can see what the member was trying to do, but I was concerned that uh, in his enthusiasm, he was potentially widening the scope of the bill beyond what we in Parliament intended. Uh, his amendments expanded the duties in relation to island communities to islands more generally. This would mean that for every island off the coast of Scotland, no matter how uh, where it was, sorry, or how small, each relevant authority would need to consider the impact in relation to the island, notwithstanding that there would be no effect on uh, island inhabitants or communities. From a quick cursory glance, we're talking around about 800 uh, islands. That is a significant extension from the 90 the bill currently covers. Uh, I'm not sure that, it, that that is what the member intended at all, uh, but it would certainly lead to a lot of potentially unnecessary work and indeed cost. It's also worth noting that other duties, of course. I mean, I think I would concede at this point that both Mr Lyle and, and the Minister have made a valid point that I, I was not thinking of the Bass Rock, for example, and um, there would be an issue because we have not consulted, I think that's probably with East Lothian, we've only consulted with the six council areas and I was thinking primarily of islands in the six council areas, so I, I'm willing to concede that that is a valid point. Thank you. Uh, maybe I, I, sh I should quit while I'm ahead with the John Mason concession. But I'll, 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 just, I'll just end on, on saying it's worth noting that uh, other duties, laws and policies relating, for example, to the protection of wildlife, uh, biodiversity, the marine environment, fisheries, uh, they will apply to uninhabited islands. So their, uh, quote unquote, their well-being uh, is already being supported in a range of ways by public bodies. However, there may also be an opportunity to put a reference to uninhabited islands into the National Islands Plan. I'd be happy to work with John Mason uh, before stage three to see what can be done in the National Islands Plan in particular so that his concerns are addressed. So uh, happy to support the MacArthur's Amendment 10. I would ask John Mason <coughs> not to move the amendments in his name. 
Uh, thank you, Minister. And I now call on Liam MacArthur to wind up uh, the debate and press or withdraw your amendment. Thank you, Commissioner. Can I just point out that one man's gentle uh, is another man's uh, weak, um, and uh, it would appear that the gentle approach may be the most appropriate uh, one to adopt in certain circumstances. Uh, can I thank all those uh, who have made their contributions and for their support? I fully recognise that the uh, amendment, as it currently uh, is framed, will need some uh, work to it. Hopefully, um, perhaps an opportunity to reflect uh, some of what I think John Mason was trying to achieve with his amendments. I, I'd certainly take on board the point about uh, some islands aren't necessarily um, uh, dependent on the other islands around them, but perhaps to the mainland. And if we can reflect that better in, in, a, in, in adaptations to this amendment at stage three, I'm more than happy uh, to do that. I'm delighted to hear from, uh, from, from Stuart that back in the 1930s, uh, the, the, the fact that Herta was part of Inverness would uh, no doubt have led to screaming headlines about centralisation gone mad even back then. Um, but nevertheless, as I say, I'm very happy to, to work with the Minister uh, and with uh, John Mason uh, ahead of stage three um, and we'll move amendment 10 in my name. Thank you very much. Uh, the question therefore we have to ask is, uh, is a, amendment 10 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. So the next question is that section 2 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. So I now call amendment 29 in the name of Colin Smith Group with amendments 80, 81, 26 and 27. Colin Smith, to move Amendment 29 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Thank you very much, Convener. <clears throat> this uh, Amendment 29 provides a definition of Ireland's authorities uh, within the list of, of key definitions. I submitted this amendment alongside uh, Amendments number 80 and 81 on local empowerment uh, and the devolution of powers to, to clarify who is referred to in those amendments. If Amendments 80 and 81 are passed, the, these are the local authorities who, who would have the capacity to make a request to ministers to devolve um, powers. If I turn now just to talk about uh, amendment number uh, 80, this, this would create a mechanism allowing ministers to devolve specific powers if a case could be demonstrated. Under this amendment, island authorities could make a request to ministers arguing their case and ministers would have to make a decision and if rejecting the request to explain the reasons why, ministers would be able to issue guidance on how this power could be used. The committee urged the government to, to consider such a mechanism at stage one, uh, although the government did say that the local democracy bill would be a better vehicle. I think the Amendment 80 is a very reasonable and workable power. It would empower island communities and allow them to be more proactive in taking actions to address local problems. This is the kind of bold action that the Bill, I believe, currently um, lacks. If the Government are not opposed to this in principle, then I believe there is no reason to wait until the Local Democracy Bill when you could bring it forward uh, at this stage. Turning to um, Amendment number 81, this, this creates a, pro a process for how retrospective impact assessments would work. It would create a mechanism for island authorities to submit a request to the Minister to amend existing primary or secondary legislation where a detrimental effect on island communities can be demonstrated. As with the previous uh, amendment, the island's authorities must make their case and ministers must respond and, if rejected again, explain the reasons why. This would not create an unreasonable burden and, and certainly wouldn't require all past legislation to be checked, as, as some people have suggested. It would simply ensure that problems in existing legislation, when they're highlighted, can be addressed. Um, I think this bill is supposed to be about empowering island communities, yet local authorities are not being trusted at this stage to use this power um, responsibly. I appreciate that Tavish Scott uh, does have an amendment, uh, two amendments, Amendment 26 and 27, which are similar to my Amendment 80. I suppose the difference is my amendment sets out a mechanism um, for requests for additional powers, but I'm, I'm happy to listen to the debate on the further amendments. I now call on Tavish Scott to speak to Amendment 26 and other amendments in the group. Tavish. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Convener. The, um, indeed, this 26, Amendment 26, as Colin Smith rightly says, is, is broadly similar to 80, uh, uh, although Colin Smith um, commendably puts more detail into the mechanism by which um, this would be done. But uh, it does, uh, 26 simply creates a mechanism to allow local authorities to make requests for additional powers. I think it's important to, to reference make requests, not demand, but make uh, requests. And I think that is a, a reasonable approach to uh, an issue which the island authorities in particular, and I respect the fact that we're dealing with more than just them in this context, um, do have um, some reasonable case to make. Uh, the bill itself makes provision for an application to, to be made for 
additional powers in the context of marine licensing. I think the Minister mentioned that earlier on. I think that's a commendable approach. Uh, and Orkney Islands Council and others indeed have argued there should be similar provision for a more general power over a range of competences. Um, that is a process that has some broad similarity to the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015. Um, so there seems to me a consistency uh, there. Uh, the only other um, observation uh, I would uh, make is that I appreciate the government's argument here is that there is a governance review underway um, looking at, uh, which is, I think, if I'm um, and still correct me, is, is, is joint working between COSLA and um, COSLA and uh, local government, uh, sorry, COSLA and the government, central government. Um, while I have the greatest respect for COSLA, there are times in my lifetime where the island's authorities have been somewhat behind, somewhat left out uh, by those discussions. And what I think this does, either either the amendment in the name of Colin Smith or, or uh, 26, is to simply put the uh, authorities that don't, do have these island responsibilities uh, centre piece in this argument. And on that basis, uh, convener, I would so move. Thank you, Tavish. Uh, I'd like now to call Stuart Stevenson, followed by John, John Finney. Uh, uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, convener. Um, right, my, my, my first comment is on uh, Amendment 29, which is, is just a, as much as anything a, a drafting issue. It's always unhelpful to repeat a list um, twice in a bill. And the list at uh, the 29 uh, after section two at one would introduce is already present in exactly the same form uh, in uh, the schedule to the bill. And, and lists are always better being in schedules as a matter of drafting. What should be in the body of the bill are actions that require to be taken rather than lists. Now, but, but the bottom line is the list should occur once in the bill, not, not, not twice. Um, and, and indeed, there is already powers uh, for the ministers to amend the list. So uh, 29, if you were to require an amendment to that point, I would suggest it, it would have to read um, just by pointing at the list that's in the schedule. Uh, that would be the, the, the proper way to do it. But that's a drafting point and not a substantive point that uh, needs to detain us uh, uh, terribly, uh, terribly long. Turning uh, to a more substantive point, which uh, relates to uh, Colin Smith's uh, Amendment 80, I've got, and, and to some extent this also applies to Tavish Scott's amendment, um, Tavish Scott, in, and, and I'll perhaps speak on Tavish Scott, because in his remarks he specifically said that his Amendment 26 is to allow local authorities to make requests. Uh, it's news to me that they're currently forbidden from making requests. I merely make that point. I don't think this creates a new power for local authorities in any way, shape or form. I accept it creates a structure within which such requests can be made, but I don't think intrinsically that it creates a new power. And of course that same uh, observation can, uh, can essentially be made uh, about uh, Colin Smith's um, uh, amendment. Now, the detail of Colin Smith's amendment, there are quite a lot of real difficulties in it. Um, if I look at uh, section one, may make a request to promote legislation devolving functions to the authority. Well, let me just make an obvious point that uh, devolution isn't simply a legislative process. In relation to uh, the Scottish Parliament's powers, we, we do have we have legislation passed at Westminster that devolves legislative competence to the Scottish Parliament. That's good. We also have secondary legislation that is legis uh, has devolved administrative competence. An example would be sections 36 and 37 of the Electricity Act uh, of 1989, uh, question mark that that's the right year, um, th that allows Scottish ministers to approve requests for generation consent, that's 36 and 37, uh, for transmission lines, um, that's devolved. And then there is a lower level of, uh, of devolution to this parliament, uh, which simply relates to um, ministers and the parliament indeed, uh, 
by agreement, by letter, by co-agreement, uh, agreeing that powers which lie with ministers will be exercised by people elsewhere. So I think the whole issue of devolution is oversimplified uh, in the way in which Colin Smith has drafted this and, and carries with the danger that we might think it's only about one particular way of dealing with this. And I'm very anxious that we ensure that uh, island communities have the maximum opportunity to maximize their individual and specific uh, oppor op opportunities. Um, now, it, it, it also is, is, is quite um, is, is quite lax in a sense, and I don't understand what this means, at three, where it says uh, the, the, the Islands Authority must submit a business case which provides evidence of community support, including support of island communities. I'm not quite sure how that uh, can be undertaken. Is that uh, uh, to be done in the same way that community buyouts have done by a ballot of people within particular postal areas? Because, of course, it may not simply be particularly in the island uh, authorities, the three island authorities, is it to be the whole of the island authorities who have to demonstrate support, or is it only uh, the community that is directly affected by the particular devolution uh, that is sought? So I'm very, very unclear, and I think it's, it, it's just simply um, not in a form. And then finally, of course, the coup de grace uh, for this particular uh, 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 amendment is the within three months, I, I just, you know, any of us who've been ministers, and there are two, two of us um, uh, sitting before the committee, uh, Tavish and myself, who, who, who I think know that uh, that is a, a, a very ambitious. I admire the ambition, but, 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 I, but I think I have to gently advise. I've taken five bills through Parliament, and I can, I can advise the committee there isn't the faintest chance of that kind of timescale. Uh, Tavish Scott's uh, timescale, of course, is a year uh, in, in essence, so it, it's a wee bit more satisfied. But I think, I think in broad terms, I think that, that I just simply can't persuade myself that I'm going to be supporting this set of amendments, however worthy the intention behind the amendments is. And I'm as anxious as any other member of the committee or any island uh, dweller uh, to make sure that we maximise the opportunities that come from the island bill. Thank you, Stuart. That was quite a uh, long uh, discussion phase. I'm going to move on to uh, John Finney uh, for, for you, and then I'm going to come to the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Uh, thank you, Convener. Well, it is the case that we're making law here, and I think we all want to make very good law. And, and I think it's also important that we discuss what our intentions are and maybe refine, refine the wording. So to get maybe a negative out of the way first in the Colin, uh, Collins Amendment 81, I, I think any organisation should, as, a, a, as a, a process, be reviewing all its uh, policies uh, um, and uh, principles on an ongoing basis. And if there is a deficiency, uh, uh, whether that relates to its application to islands, to cities, to rural communities, then that should be addressed. So I, I would hope that that wouldn't be a, a, a huge uh, administrative exercise. And I think it were, when this bill is passed, as uh, inevitably it will be, that will maybe focus minds of all the people in the schedule to look to see what, if anything, they can do. So um, the, the issue of retrospection um, clearly has to be discussed and addressed, but I don't think it's a huge process. But turning to, to the, the, the substantive one here, 80 um, in Colin's name and 26 in Tavish Scott's name, um, taking a different approach doesn't fragment things. In fact, if we get that approach right, it binds people together. So uh, I, I think that this is an opportunity in both these amendments in 80 and, and 26 to look at what we should be planning to do here, and that is devolve as much as we can reasonably devolve. Um, so um, whether that's um, functions, powers, um, um, I, I think... Um, it's important that we take the opportunity that this legislation provides to do that. And uh, I'll certainly be supportive of both 80 and 26. Thank you, John. Uh, Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Um, to start off um, with Colin Smith's Amendment 80, um, whilst I absolutely agree that it's good to have deadlines for these sort of things, because I think it does focus minds, um, I will disagree with Stuart Stevenson. I don't think you have to be a minister to realise that within three months and within six months is 
possibly quite constraining. Um, so f for that reason, I think that, and, and also it says it again, they've got the three months and the six months. Um, I just um, wonder if Colin Smith could explain why he came up with the three and six months. Was there a, a legal uh, reason behind it or that would be... I'm, I'm sure he'll intervene if, 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 he, he, if, he, he, feel, if he feels he needs to. Um, as for um, 80, I mean, we, we did hear from um, island communities about uh, retrospective legislation and indeed when we were in Orkney, Orkney and Shetland came up with several examples that we could be looking at right now and again have great sympathy for these. I just don't know if it's the right place to have them within the bill in such detail as we have and again we've got the three and six months um, but I'll be interested to hear what the Minister has to say on that point. Um, to move on to Tavish Scott's amendment, um, I would just, a couple of points about the, the wording on um, three, must demonstrate reasonable cause and must not unreasonably refuse. These seem to be quite subjective um, points and I just wondered um, if the wording for that is quite right. And I think for um, section, um, sorry, amendment 80, and also um, Amendment 26. When we, when we visited all the islands that we went to and spoke to all the island communities, it wasn't just the local authorities that communities wanted to be consulted, it was actually the islanders themselves. And I don't see anything within these amendments that actually consults lower than local authority level. Thank you. Um, and, and of course, uh, Colin, you can uh, respond to that when you do your summing up at the end. So uh, the next person is Peter Chapman, followed by Mike Rumbles. Um, thanks, convener. I, first of all, uh, uh, Amendment 29, uh, 29, am I right? Yeah, 29 in uh, Colin Smith's name. I agree with that. I think it, it, just, it just makes pragmatic sense that we, we understand what the island authorities are and are listed there, and, and we can just refer to them as island authorities from there on. So that, I think that we can support that. Make an intervention and explain why we need to have a second uh, list when the list is already present in the bill as drafted in the schedule. Sorry, can, I just, can, I just... can I just say that? But, uh, I mean, I ask for an intervention and then don't leap straight Sorry. into the question pardon, because the member may not wish to take the intervention. Mm. Um, I, I'm sure now that he's heard the question, he'll definitely want to answer <laughs> it. Uh, Mr. Chapman. <laughs> Yeah, I, well, I, 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 I take the point that, that maybe they've already been listed, but I think it, it does no harm to, to, to clarify the point again. So I think we can, I can support Colin Smith's amendment on that basis. Uh, and as far as Amendment 80 is concerned, I agree with the sentiment. But, uh, you know, we have recognised throughout that this is a community empowerment bill. We want to empower everyone in the islands and the, the community, not simply hand over increasing powers to councils with islands or islands authority. I think a similar point that uh, Gail Ross was making, I, I agree with that. And, and you know, we've got to recognise that many councils are already stretched thin with budget cuts and, and uh, I don't know if they have the resources to manage uh, this um, and I'm not sure it's exactly what the bill is set out to do. Um, so I'm not, uh, you know, I have, sent, I, have, I have sympathy with it but I don't think it's in, in the form that it's in, I can support it. And 81, similarly, I think the same argument is, is uh, relevant there. And to a large extent, in Tavish Scott's Amendment 26, is, is, I have similar thoughts in it. Again, I appreciate the sentiment, but I don't think, I'm not sure this is for the bill to decide. I think it causes imbalance, imbalances if local government, if different authorities are requesting different powers. Each island will have its, have its own experience, and therefore you could end up with a misshape and an overrule, you know, that, that, that becomes a, a, could end up in a bit of a mess. So this, yeah, I will. I'm grateful for the member taking intervention. Would the member accept that quite often we hear, indeed, from, from a, a number of benches, not only his own benches, that one size doesn't fit all? Mm. And that it is appropriate to have responses and policies and practices that apply to the different areas that uh, are across the yeah, uh, I, I take John Finney's argument, and, and I think, I, I, you know, as I said, I have some sympathy with the thing, but I just, I just feel that it maybe goes too far and, and, and uh, it might be it might be a, a step further than I would like to, to support. And likewise, say, uh, 27 follows on from that. So for the same reason, I will be saying no to 27. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Mike Rumbles followed by Richard Lamb. 
Thank you, Convener. It's interesting. It's, it's curious that John had just mentioned, John Finney had just mentioned the phrase one size doesn't fit all, and I've just written that down in response to what Peter had been saying, because I often hear Peter, uh, Peter uh, Chapman saying that. Mm -hmm. So I'm surprised to find Peter takes that view. Um, I have to say, uh, I think all these amendments are, are, are good ones, but I have to make a choice between uh, Colin Smith and, and Tavish Scott. I think Tavish Scott's amendment is much better in as much as that um, it, doesn't, it doesn't put the time scale in. It, that's, I, I do think, I, I, I listened to what Gail Ross has just said, I think the time scale is, is difficult. But I mean, that's the good thing about, as I said earlier on, about having stage two and stage three. So we could choose either of them. But my preference would be Tavish Scott simply because, actually, I, I responded to, to the comment earlier on, a relevant local authority must demonstrate reasonable cause for making a request and that the Scottish ministers must not unreasonably refuse to grant the request. Those are legal terms, actually. So um, people do know what those mean. And um, they, are, they are, therefore, reasonable. And I think being a reasonable person, and I'm sure most people around this table are... Nearly everybody around this table today is a reasonable person would uh, accept that uh, Tavish Scott has, a, has a, a better stab at this at the moment than, than Colin. But we can, of course, change these things at stage three. Uh, Richard Lowell, and then I'm going to come to the Minister. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I, I don't think I could support Colin Smith's uh, amendment or Tavish Scott's. And, you know, the, the point that uh, Stuart uh, Stevenson made, you know, that basically the points are in there and with the greatest respect to Peter Chapman uh, having previously been a councillor for decades, I'll not mention in many years, I found that 32 councils in Cosla, 32 councils have 32 different ways of doing things, it's commonly called local democracy And on that note we'll move to the Minister Thank you, uh, Convener I'm going to ask, uh, of course uh, both members not to Press their amendments, but I will come to, to Tavish Scott's because I think they have more appeal to them and see if I can work with Tavish uh, Scott uh, before stage three to try to give some effect to, to what he's trying to, 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 to achieve. Uh, if I may, perhaps I'll, I'll speak first to the government's uh, policy. We are committed to the principle uh, of subsidiarity. That means, of course, that decisions should be democratically accountable and taken as close as possible to the people that they may affect. Uh, recently took an important step on the community empowerment journey when the Scottish Government stood with COSLA in the launch of the Local Governance Review last December, which a couple of members have referenced, notwithstanding the points that Tavish Scott made that uh, perhaps island uh, communities and island authorities don't always feel uh, like they, they, their views are always uh, perhaps at the forefront. Uh, that is, again, something that uh, we can reflect on uh, in terms of the local governance uh, review uh, and the, the, the legislative measures we're bringing forward. Uh, the review, of course, looks to reform the way that Scotland is uh, governed at the local level. Our approach uh, is being shaped by listening very carefully to the development of ideas on this issue. For example, uh, the COSLA-backed Commission on Strengthening Local Democracy. Uh, the key element of the review will be for the Scottish Government to invite individual local authorities community planning partnerships, regional partnerships and other public sector organisations to propose place-specific alternative approaches to governance. Uh, one size fits all solutions uh, risk failing to recognise the huge diversity of Scotland. That's why we're interested in new local decision-making arrangements that have been designed with particular places uh, firmly in mind. Extensive engagement with communities uh, will also begin shortly in order to surface the best ideas on how to transform local democracy in Scotland. Uh, again, island communities will have a stake and a role to play in this. Uh, we are obviously committed to introducing, as members have already referenced, uh, a local democracy bill in this parliament. This will provide a more appropriate legislative option to make new place-specific governance arrangements, including potentially those which include or specifically for island authorities. This would be a good example of island proofing in action. Uh, these changes would sit alongside and complement legislative provisions to, to decentralise more powers to local communities more generally. In last year's uh, programme for government, we made a commitment to support those island authorities who want to establish a single authority model of de delivering local services. And we know island authorities are already, already, already actively working with local partners to develop some concrete proposals. These will be considered as part of the review process and we look forward to supporting 
new local governance arrangements which can help our island communities to thrive. Uh, these amendments would preempt this work uh, and can lead to a missed opportunity for the islands or result in a lack of coherence with new decision-making arrangements that are later introduced. So while the government certainly agrees with the spirit of these amendments, we believe it necessary that for something as fundamental as a transfer of powers, it needs to go through a proper and rigorous engagement and consultation process, including, of course, with local communities, not just with the local authority. Uh, something uh, which has not yet happened in the context of this bill on this matter, and which would be best achieved through the local governance review process. I therefore uh, cannot support the amendments uh, as they stand, although, as I say, the, amendment from Tav or the amendments from Tavish Scott uh, certainly have more appeal to me in the use of regulations to set out the process. So there may be something in this, as long as we're mindful uh, of the local governance review. And as I say, I'd be willing to work with the member before stage three if he was to withdraw uh, his amendments. Uh, we can have that, uh, take forward that conversation. Uh, I would ask Colin Smith to not press his amendments in the group. Um, and as I say, for Tavis Scott not to move them, but to work with us. Uh, amendment 81 from Colin Smith uh, is another interesting proposal. The amendment would create a duty on Scottish ministers to have regard to requests from island authorities in respect to improving or mitigating existing primary or secondary legislation for island communities. The amendment sets out the process and the timescales, uh, and there has been a lot of good conversation uh, around this from those that have been uh, ministers, but of course also those uh, as backbenchers uh, in terms of the timescales involved. So while I understand the thinking behind this amendment, I, I, I don't think it's, it's necessary. As things stand right now, uh, any island authority can come forward to ministers with concerns they have regarding pieces of legislation. They can set out their concerns in ways described in the amendment and we will respond to that. In my dealings, in fact, uh, with the six uh, local authorities since taking up the post, I've proactively encouraged them to do just that uh, and let me know of any difficulties they're encountering, of course. Um, thank you, um, convener. Thank you, Minister. Does the Minister have, um, because as I said in, in my remarks earlier, we did hear about <coughs> existing legislation that is um, possibly having a negative effect on some of the islands. Have any of the island authorities come forward with any requests at present? Yeah, I think it's a good question. A number of local authorities have said that they're working on kind of concrete plans, and they, they sometimes are not always to do with legislation, sometimes they're to do with guidance. So house building regulations, insulation guidance, uh, and, and, and a few other issues uh, that actually some members will touch upon in their amendments mm -hmm. uh, later on have often uh, been brought uh, to me. And in fact, the last discussion I had on this with local authorities uh, was in Millport, where we uh, had the Convention of Highlands and Islands, and I met with the six authorities um, and I reiterated that offer, and a couple of them uh, indicated that they'll be coming forward with... Um, because nobody really agreed with his blanket approach to, 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 to looking at uh, legislation, but they said they would come forward uh, with that. But they also said they would look at opportunities for further devolution uh, and, and where they thought there they could be some, um, some proactive movement on that. So that is uh, in train. Um, I understand that we're, we're, we're short for, for time. Uh, I would just make the point that I think other members have made, just to reiterate it, Convener, uh, from past experience where one island authority has indicated that they have difficulties with the requirements of a particular piece of legislation, there are sometimes other island authorities who have no issue with that very same piece of legislation. So um, the problem might be more uh, local implementation. Um, there is a risk with a provision like Amendment 81 that we create a system that could lead to endless requests uh, to change legislation before it's even properly been embedded uh, or indeed uh, implemented. I'm satisfied that the power is already in the bill on island proofing will give practical effect to what Mr Smith is trying to achieve uh, with his amendment. Just on the timescales of things, um, I would say that um, the requirements within the amendment that legislation must come forward within six months uh, are also not practical to bring forward a bill. We obviously need time to consult, a standard of three months, then to instruct and to draft, assuming no tricky legal issues come up during consultation, to work to such a timescale, uh, would risk the creation of bad and ineffectual legislation, or indeed uh, worth, worse legislation that could potentially be out with the Parliament's uh, competence. Um, uh, even if ministers initially supported a proposal, there may be other constraints on us bringing forward uh, that legislation. We know there's long established process for bringing forward legislation, uh, including, of course, members' bills uh, and others. But I fear that if the introduction of this provision could become uh, the default starting position for island authorities, if they don't like a, a particular piece of legislation, rather than engaging proactively through the means that we already have. So on that basis, I would urge Colin Smith not to uh, move Amendment 81 and for other members not to support that uh, amendment. Thank you, Minister. And I'm now going to call on Colin Smith to, to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment, please.
Thank you very much, Convener. I, mean, I believe strongly that Amendments 29, 80 and 81 take forward uh, very clear recommendations uh, from this committee. I, I don't agree with Stuart Stevenson uh, that there are, uh, indeed the Minister, that there are existing mechanisms in place. Uh, if, there, if these existing mechanisms were satisfactory, then we wouldn't be having a discussion um, about future uh, legislation on local democracy. Um, I think a number of uh, points that have been made uh, on the detail of the amendment are valid. I think they can be tidied up at stage three, for example, on the issues of, of timescales. I mean, one of the things that I've discovered quite early on uh, as an MSP is that when the government promised to do something, unless there's a very clear timescale, then you, know, you, you can't hold your breath. Spring sometimes for the local, for, for Scottish government, can last about a year and a half. And certainly, I've got commitments to... Uh, to do something in spring last year, uh, and I'm still, or, or even longer, as Stuart Stevenson has just told me, <laughs> speaking from clear experience, I'm sure. Um, so, you know, I take on board the points that are made about timescales, but I believe they can be amended at stage three, and the government can put in what they regard as a realistic timescale. But I think timescales are important to focus in um, people's minds. And, and the final point I'd make is that, that Peter Chapman made the point that this is putting burdens on local authorities. I think it's important to point out that the request for these powers actually comes from the island authorities themselves. I don't think as a committee we should be telling those authorities what's good for them. We should be listening to what those authorities want, and that's why they've requested um, that this be dealt with as part of the, the island's bill. So I'm happy to, to put forward uh, my amendments. OK, so that, that therefore leads to a question, and the question is, is Amendment 29 agreed? Are we agreed? No. We are not agreed. I call a division. Can I ask those in favour of Amendment 29 to raise their hands, please. Those against. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Therefore, there are no abstentions. We have six votes, uh, four and five against, therefore the amendment is agreed. And at that stage, I'm going to briefly suspend the meeting for five minutes, but I would ask members to be promptly back here uh, in five minutes, ready to reconvene. Thank you, so I suspend the meeting for five minutes.
I'd like to reconvene the meeting of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Bit, uh, Committee to consider the Islands Bill. I'd now like to ask the Minister to move Amendment 1 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. This group is about the content of the plan, and there are a large number of amendments in it. If they are all agreed to, Section 3 would go from two subsections to 15. So I think it's fair to say in relation to the group and others, we'll need to take stock of how the bill ends up uh, after Stage 2 consideration, see what needs to be revisited at Stage 3. To ensure the amended bill becomes the most effective legislation it can be, with our shared ambition for the National Islands Plan, and what it can achieve appropriately reflected in this legislation. In this group, I will discuss uh, the other amendments uh, after explaining Amendment 1 and 2 in my name. We've already discussed some of the issues around high-level objectives in Group 1 when we discussed the purpose of the Act. Uh, I set out, uh, as I said out again today, I think the purpose of the National Islands Plan is, more meaningful, is a more meaningful place to deliver the aims of the Committee for high-level objectives to be incorporated into the Bill. My Amendment 1, which I have brought forward, seeks to adjust language in Section 3 to make the purpose of the plan clear on the face of the bill. It amends Section 3, subsection 2, to state that, quote, the purpose of preparing a National Islands Plan is to set out the main objectives and strategy of the, Scot of the Scottish Ministers in relation to improving outcomes for island communities. <clears throat> Amendment 2 then expands on the term improving outcomes. It sets out that improving outcomes for island communities includes the three underpinning objectives listed in the amendment, that is, sustainable economic development, health and wellbeing, and community empowerment. I believe these high-level objectives encapsulate the evidence that committee heard during stage one and go to the heart of what we're trying and attempting to do to improve the lives of those who live and work on our islands. This does not limit what can be included in the plan, but will help provide strategic direction, focusing resources and where necessary targets, of course, in key areas of activity. I hope that members will support these amendments uh, today, though I recognise that members may well have a view on a mission and what might usefully be added to these strategic objectives. I would, of course, be willing to engage and work with and listen to any of members who feel that this section can be further improved before Stage 3. I also recognise that through the committee's evidence gathering, there's been a wide variety of opinion on how prescriptive we should be on the face of the bill as regards to the areas the plans will cover. Um, while I recognise there are specific issues that members might wish to put more detail in the face of the bill, uh, I would urge some caution. The committee's recommendation in their stage one report stated, and I quote, consultation should be undertaken as widely as possible. And also, quote, when the committee scrutinises the draft plan laid before this parliament, it will wish to be assured that the priority areas featured in the plan reflect the actual priority of islanders. To therefore place very specific detailed points on the face of the bill at this stage seems to me to go against that very spirit of the stage one recommendation from the committee and prejudges the view of island communities. Now that's not to say that ferries, broadband uh, and other topics won't appear in the plan. I've got no doubt in fact that they absolutely will. It just seems to me that it's unfair to island communities and other stakeholders to present a pre-populated plan uh, for them to just simply tinker around uh, the edges. That is not my aim, I'm certain, I'm certain it's not the aim of any members uh, around this table, uh, as well as Parliament indeed, uh, is having, uh, as well as Parliament having a role in setting the parameters and aspirations for the plan, we need to allow, to, we need of course appropriate time and we need to allow uh, external input uh, as well. Uh, Amendment 2A from Colin Smith seeks to add to the high level objective list by including, quote, taking steps to increase the population of islands. The goal of achieving population growth and the long-term future sustainability of our island communities is something I think we're all in agreement uh, with, and therefore I'm happy to support uh, that amendment. Uh, before I go on to the other members' amendments, it uh, is uh, this form of amendment as put forward by Colm Smith, where we can perhaps find some common ground. It adds to the objective, but does not prescribe what the solution would necessarily be. If I turn to Amendment 11 from Tavis Scott, I'm aware of the member's keen interest uh, in the Crown Estate through a variety of conversations that we have had. He'll be aware of the ongoing dialogue with the Scottish Government and now the Crown Estate uh, Scotland Interim Management uh, have been having with island authorities and others on the issues of transferring or delegating the functions of managing the Crown Estate to local authorities. I understand the reasoning for the Member's Amendment, but Scottish Ministers have shown their commitment 
to further reform of the Scottish Crown Estate. Uh, we've consulted on proposals to reform before the devolution from the UK level uh, was completed on the 1st of, of, 20, uh, 1st of April 2017, and we laid a bill uh, in January. The consultation promoted the prospect of a phased approach with further devolution of assets in the island being considered under a first phase of reforms. Uh, the Member's Amendment seeks to include in the island's bill legal requirements relating to process of planning for delegation of management of the Scottish Crown Estate. Uh, this would, I think, uh, unfortunately lead to a confusing position as the requirements for planning reforms to management would be split across two pieces of legislation, so this bill uh, and the Scottish Crown Estates bill. This could interfere with planning uh, under the Scottish Crown Estates uh, bill. I believe this am uh, amendment isn't necessary uh, as it stands and would present some technical problems. Section 20 of the Scottish Crown Estate Bill requires a national strategic plan to be prepared, and Section 21 requires that plan to be reviewed every five years. That being the case, the appropriate place for planning the future of the Scottish Crown Estate uh, is in the plans of its managers, and the island's plan should not predetermine the content of that national strategic plan. Um, requiring the intentions over the next five years to be set out could frustrate the policy foundation uh, of Part 2 of the Scottish Crown Estates Bill. So I'd be happy to explore with uh, Mr Scott uh, and indeed Rosanna Cunningham, the lead uh, minister on the Crown Estate, um, how we might better address the effect he's trying to achieve and therefore invite Mr Scott not to move his amendment. Uh, moving on to Amendment 12 from Liam MacArthur. I fully understand Mr MacArthur's desire to see ferries specifically referenced within the plan, given the importance of these services, not only obviously to, uh, to Orkney, uh, but also to island uh, communities right across Scotland. There's no doubt that ferries uh, and indeed wider transport issues will of course be covered in detail within the National Islands Plan, and I can give that uh, undertaking. Reliable and efficient transport connections, whether it's by ferries or indeed planes, are hugely important to our island communities and in many instances are regarded as uh, lifeline services. Therefore, without question, uh, as I say, happy to, on the record, give a commitment that they would be prominent uh, in any future National Islands Plan. In terms of the specific detail of Mr MacArthur's amendment, he, he won't, uh, I suspect, be surprised to discover uh, I don't think it's necessary, at least in the level of detail that's been put forward. Uh, take, for example, the Scottish Government. Uh, back in 2012, we produced our first ever Scottish Ferries Plan covering the period 2013 to 2022. This was the result of extensive analytical consultation our work have recently signalled that uh, we uh, will renew this and produce a new plan in good time for the expiry of the current one. Uh, this again will be, you know, include of course engagement with stakeholders, extensive analytical consultation work and so on and so forth. Uh, that new plan of course will also be island proofed given the statute duties in this uh, bill. Um, I also want to see the new ferries plan within the context of the National Transport Strategy and the STPR. Uh, the timescales of the new ferries plan will not, however, be deliverable ahead of, for example, the first National Islands plan. So for all these reasons, I'm not able to support the member's amendment today, but I'm happy again to work with Mr MacArthur to explore how we might better address the effect uh, he tries to achieve. So I would uh, ask him and urge him not to press his amendments. Um, turning to Amendment 13, which again is from Lee MacArthur, I think everybody recognises the huge challenge that fuel poverty presents in communities right across Scotland. And can I also give credit to Lee MacArthur, because I know he's raised this issue, uh, which is particularly acute uh, in Orkney on a number of occasions in this parliament, whether through committee uh, or indeed uh, the chamber. The member is very aware the Scottish Government has just recently concluded a consultation on new fuel poverty strategy. Uh, responses are currently being considered uh, and will help inform the development of that draft strategy to be published uh, in May, as well as inform the Warm Homes Bill, which is due to be uh, introduced in Parliament before the summer. Uh, as members will be aware, fuel poverty is not just an island's issue. Uh, our aim is to ensure that we direct help to anyone suffering from the impacts of fuel poverty. Uh, we've consulted on rural and island issues and will seek to uh, island-proof the warm home bills ahead of introduction. Uh, that said, Mr MacArthur's uh, amendment as it stands would predetermine uh, how elements of the warm home bills, the strategy and the delivery priorities are set out before Parliament has had the chance to fully uh, examine them, uh, potentially limiting its options uh, and I would say hindering the, the parliamentary scrutiny process. Uh, for those reasons, I can't support the amendment, but again, I'd be happy to work with Mr MacArthur and the Minister for Housing uh, to arrange a meeting to explore how we can ensure the particular needs of island communities in relation to fuel poverty are reflected in the legislation. So on that front, would uh, invite Mr MacArthur not to move his amendment 
with that guarantee. In terms of Amendment 14 from Tavish Scott, um, in a similar vein, the Scottish Government, he knows, I'm sure, is committed to extending superfast broadband across Scotland by the end of 2021. Procurement is well underway. We have uh, embarked upon a competitive dialogue uh, to, to, to phase, uh, dialogue phase with our shortlisted bidders. We expect to have suppliers in place and ready to start delivering in early 2019. Um, the current uh, the D DSSB programme has transformed broadband for islands. Uh, as you know, uh, thanks to our investment and that of our partners, uh, new subsea fibre cables have been deployed and an extensive fibre coverage on Orkney, Shetland and the West Islands. So it's, our commitment uh, is absolutely there. The coverage of the footprint to be delivered by the successful R100 bidders uh, and a detailed deployment plan will only be confirmed at the end of the procurement process at the turn uh, of the year. So absolutely committed. Uh, the member acknowledges uh, the procurement deliverability of projects on this scale does require many months of proper investigation uh, before timescales and targets can be identified. So I would caution against suggesting the targets can be brought forward by nine months, uh, as suggested by the member's amendment. If the target can be met sooner, then of course uh, that would be welcomed by everybody, uh, including by government. So, uh, in conclusion, I cannot support the amendment as drafted, but as previously indicated with other amendments in this grouping, be happy and more than happy to explore with the member an alternative form of wording to ensure the importance of digital connectivity to our island communities is recognised within the plan. I hope with these reassurances, uh, I can urge Mr Scott not to move his amendment. Uh, amendment 15, again, from Tavish Scott, relates to the ongoing discussions between the Scottish Government and UK Government and Islands, three Holy Island Councils, about the possibility of a future Islands deal. I completely understand the intention uh, of the amendment and appreciate the member uh, obviously has a clear constituency interest. I would like to reassure all members that the Scottish Government is committed 100% to 100% coverage of Scotland with growth deals, including our Scottish islands. In line with the recommendations made by Local Government and Communities Committee following their inquiry into city region deals, we've asked the UK Government to make a clear commitment to join us in that common purpose and agree a timescale for doing so. Uh, government officials are in dialogue with Local Government and other colleagues leading to the development of an islands deal, and it's something I have discussed uh, also with island local authorities. I don't think this amendment is the best way to ensure progress. Indeed, in seeking to oblige the UK government to be part of an island's deal through primary legislation, I think that arguably the amendment might not even be competent. But the Scottish government has successfully delivered three uh, city region deals with the, with the UK government already. Uh, more are in the pipeline. We don't need primary legislation to deliver these deals or work hard towards our focus on 100% coverage uh, of Scotland with growth deals. So I therefore ask Mr Scott not to move uh, his amendment, but of course, as always, as I've said, uh, happy to have a discussion and dialogue about uh, how we can make uh, best progress uh, towards an islands deal. Amendment 16 is from John Finney. It calls on the Scottish ministers to set out uh, in the plan a strategy for the maintenance of biosecurity of Scotland's islands in order to protect their unique natural heritage, cultural heritage uh, and economy. I've discovered in recent days biosecurity is a broad term uh, that encompasses uh, many aspects of disease and harm prevention. Good biosecurity has the potential to protect wildlife, uh, fragile ecosystems and animal uh, and indeed, excuse me, and indeed public health. The Scottish Government is fully supportive of good biosecurity measures. Biosecurity is collaborative and we recognise the essential roles that stakeholders the wider industry and indeed local councils play in maintaining good biosecurity. And this is demonstrated in the biosecurity codes and the plans that the Scottish Government has already agreed with a number of sectors. So while I appreciate uh, the members' amendment, I, I don't feel that, uh, similar to other group uh, amendments in this grouping, I do not feel that the face of the bill is the right place for the level of detail that the amendment seeks and the requirement that it places on ministers and other authorities. It is, however, a very interesting and commendable proposal, and I'm again willing to explore with the member perhaps an alternative form of words ahead of stage three to ensure this important issue is recognised within uh, the plan. Um, Amendment 31 from Jimmy Green. Uh, as indicated in our response to the committee stage one report, we would anticipate the plan would indeed include a series of outcomes, targets, and measurable indicators across the full range of government activities to allow for monitoring and assessment of its progress. That said, I'm sure the member will acknowledge these will vary. Therefore, it's not always possible to give a guarantee that every single objective, especially high-level objectives covered by the plan, can realistically uh, be, be, be measured. On that basis, as it stands, I, I do not think the government can support this amendment. But if the member is willing, uh, following the conclusion of stage two, I'm happy to explore with him, again, an alternative wording that will deliver on the spirit of his amendment at stage three which the government could support. And I therefore urge the member 
not to move his amendment. Uh, convener, uh, Amendment 32 again from uh, Jamie Green is the final amendment in this grouping and seeks to ensure that the plan uh, lists the public authorities that have duties under the Act. Uh, in principle, I have no uh, issue with uh, no objection to supporting this amendment requiring the plan to list authorities. I do wonder if it's necessary. Uh, it would be helpful, helpful to hear from the member. His thinking behind it in the first instance before agreeing to accept it, the schedule that accompanies the bill already lists all the relevant authorities that have duties in relation to island communities. I know at my appearance on the 8th of November, the member had questions around the reference uh, to Scottish ministers in the schedule and whether this included all Scottish government agencies. I'm told that it's normal for an act to, to refer to the Scottish ministers, which is a relevant legal person under the Scotland Act and therefore covers all agencies uh, without naming them. Uh, that is actually desirable as ministerial agencies can be created and, of course, can change over time. Uh, if that's the reason behind his amendment, then rather than moving his amendment today, perhaps a member would consider withdrawing it at this stage with a view to exploring with me the best way to achieving the clarity he seeks uh, to close and move amendment in my name. Amendment one in my name. Thank you, uh, Minister. And there are quite a lot of members now to speak. Um, and I'd just, again, uh, ask you to concentrate on, on the particular amendment. So I'm going to ask Colin Smith to speak to amendment 2A and the other amendments in the group. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. Very briefly, 2A um, seeks to amend um, <coughs> Amendment 2 uh, under the Minister's name to include action on depopulation. I think this is one of the key challenges facing island communities, and it's important that it's included in the plan's aim, and I welcome the Minister's support for that. As far as the other amendments are concerned, I have a great deal of sympathy for the, um, the aims of those amendments, but I'll listen to what members have to say when putting them forward. Thank you, Colin. Uh, Tavis Scott, speak to Amendment 11, please, and the other amendments in the group. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. Can I appreciate the tone of the Minister's remarks? Um, it's always difficult to issue a great rant in, in response to a Minister who's entirely reasonable when uh, knocking your amendments into touch, uh, but I'll, I'll uh, do my best. Three points to make um, on the three amendments I've got uh, in this group, uh, Convener 11, 14 and 15. On the Crown Estate, um, uh, on the Crown Estate powers, uh, the Minister made a very fair point at the start of his remarks about um, what policies are, are the actual priority of islanders. Well, I think, I'm sure he would take the observation that the devolution of the seabed to the islands is unfinished business for the islands and very much a priority for islanders, and that's what this amendment seek to, seeks to do. Uh, I, I would argue there is a difference between um, this particular aspect, which after all was a commitment of the Smith Commission, very grateful to the cross-party support, including the Deputy First Minister on the Smith Commission, for the very clear language on this particular um, issue. And that, I would argue, is slightly different from the wider aspects in the National Strategic Plan on the Crown, which the Minister very fairly mentioned in his remarks. And that is, I think, the, the one context, the one that, sorry, aspect that I would ask the Minister just to reflect on in, in his, uh, his wind-up. But I take what he said in relation to um, uh, uh, the other bill that... Uh, that his colleague Rosanna Cunningham is taking through Parliament. On broadband, um, again, I take the Minister's remark, this is a government policy I entirely support in terms of what it seeks to achieve, and I uh, could argue, uh, also possibly not hugely successfully, that this, is, this amendment actually is entirely complementary uh, to the uh, government's work. But what I would say is that um, the broadband rollout is absolutely fundamental to any of the islands. Uh, and in that sense, that's the purpose of that uh, amendment. And on 15, finally, convener, um, uh, there just should be a, an islands uh, deal as well. I thought he might rather like my suggestion that he should tell the UK government what to do, but I, I, I take the spirit of what we're dealing with later this afternoon on the continuity bill that perhaps possibly I would be the least best person to make that argument, given what no doubt I'll argue in a couple of hours' time. But, the, um, uh, that, but I do think there's, there's a really important role for that islands deal. And again, this was to, this amendment was to, uh, to bring that in front of the committee uh, because I believe that is a fundamentally important uh, next stage in the development of the islands, which in that sense is consistent with the bill, and on that basis I would so move. Thank you, uh, Tavish. Uh, call Liam MacArthur to speak to Amendment 12 and the other amendments in the group. Thank you, uh, Convener. I can I too start by thanking the Minister for the, the tone and the content of much of what he had to say. Obviously, Amendments 12 and 13 follow a similar theme to Tavish Scott's. I believe there is an opportunity through this bill and specifically the island's plan to ensure that safeguards and commitments are put in place to ensure the provision of services to island communities uh, meet certain standards as a minimum and that uh, the needs of island communities are not uh, an afterthought as so often appears to be 
the case in terms of Amendment 12, it deals with uh, the issue of ferry, ferry services, something uh, I'm pleased to say that Tavish and uh, I have managed to get the Parliament speaking rather a lot about over uh, the last three or four min months. As the Minister rightly acknowledged, the, the 2012 ferries plan uh, does set out minimum standards uh, for levels of service. Sadly, though, these are not always met, and I think the lifeline internal services in Orkney are a case in point. This can't continue. I think the agreement around the budget paves the way uh, for resolving that. Uh, but before deciding whether or not to press Amendment 12, I would seek assurance from the Minister uh, that he will instil a degree of urgency to those negotiations with uh, Orkney Islands Council in identifying that longer-term solution, commit to updating Parliament ahead of the summer recess on progress, and agree to help towards the funding of the business case upon which that longer-term solution uh, will need to be based. Turning to Amendment 13, as colleagues will be aware, Orkney has the very dubious honour of being uh, the area with the highest proportion of fuel poor households anywhere in the country. Uh, the government previously recognised the specific nature of fuel poverty in rural and island areas and the challenges in tackling it through um, the work of the Rural uh, Fuel Poverty Task Force. However, as I understand it, the revised definition of fuel poverty announced by ministers uh, drives a coach and horses yeah. through this and risks artificially deflating fuel poverty levels in Ireland and rural communities generally by as much as 20 per cent and all the indications are that if that's the case the warm homes bill will fall far short of the needs of communities who desperately need a tailored approach to be taken. Uh, those concerns have been raised by uh, those active in fuel poverty uh, measures in Orkney but across the Highlands and Islands more widely and I welcome uh, Hamza Yusuf's recognition not just of my efforts but the, the efforts more widely and welcome also his commitment to work with myself and with the Housing Minister hopefully ahead of stage through uh, stage three on this bill uh, to ensure that uh, the concerns that have been raised will be properly picked up in the Warm Homes Bill uh, which will obviously follow on um, after the, uh, the Ireland's Bill has been dealt with but on that basis I'm happy at the moment uh, not to, to move on Amendment 13. Thank you. Thank you. I now call John Finney to speak to Amendment 16 and the other members of, uh, in the group. Um, th thank you, Convener. Um, my amendment, as has been said, is to insert a reference to biosecurity in the National Islands Plan uh, in the section of the Bill. And, and I hear what the Minister said about pre-populating the plan, and, and we have the ever-present debate about what shouldn't and shouldn't be in the, the uh, face of the Bill. Can I say in relation to this, and I'll... I'll, I'll greatly curtail what I, what I was going to say, but invasive species is a, are a major driver of biodiversity loss and islands are particularly vulnerable. Um, and putting in place uh, this sort of system would not only protect the environment, the natural environment, but also safeguard economic and agricultural in, um, interests as well. And the experience suggests that this would, uh, being in place, would significantly reduce the risk of new incursions. The sort of thing we're talking about is the eradication of mink, for instance, in the West Niles, and the positive impact that had for poultry, um, the, the clearing of, of rats from the, the Shant Islands, and, and a, an issue um, such as the invasive species of stoats now in Orkney, uh, where it's an, it's an issue. And uh, techniques of involvement. Uh, and you know this was to seek explicit reference on the face of the bill to it but I, I do hear what the minister says and if, if he's minded to be supportive of this approach then I'm certainly very happy to, 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 to discuss um, it, it appearing in the plan rather than the face of the bill. If I can touch briefly on some of the other amendments um, in the, the bill, the, 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 some of the, the language, the tidying up language of course will be supported um, if I'm in the right section, yes, um, Mr Smith's uh, one in island population, certainly. Uh, Tavish Scott's comments about the, the devolution of the seabed, I, I think, are, are very important. And, and I think this is a, a, a fundamental opportunity that shouldn't be lost. As regards the issue of, of the ferry services, of course, very important. Um, and the Minister acknowledges the huge, huge challenge around fuel poverty. And, and likewise, that, that, that's very important. And, and taking the approach um, that uh, I, I hope perhaps my colleagues will take the approach that, that I've taken and, and not press this. It's important that these issues are highlighted, but um, I, I do concede that uh, we need to promote them rather than necessarily have them in the face of the bill. I'll leave things there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John, and thank you for, for curtailing what you were saying. Uh, and I call on Jamie Green to speak to Amendment 31 and other uh, amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, again, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll shrink uh, many of my comments. It's a very lengthy uh, grouping section. Um, I'll, I'll deal with 31 and 32 first uh, in relation to the Minister's comments. Uh, the intention behind 31 is to ensure that the objectives 
that are referred to in the islands plan are measurable. And I think that's important for two reasons. The first is that uh, a later amendment of mine, 40, is around review uh, of, of the Act and its success thereof. And I think if objectives are not measurable in some way, it's very difficult for ministers and indeed for us to see whether uh, these objectives have been met or otherwise. Now, I've been very uh, purposely uh, light on wording in this. I haven't said how they should be measured, whether they should be targets, whether they should be uh, the different forms of how the minister chooses to measure whether the objectives are met or not. But I think it's important that we do have some wording in there that they aren't just uh, vague um, concepts, that these objectives are able to be uh, uh, targeted in some way as, as the minister sees fit when he produces his plan. Um, for that reason, I would be minded to push Amendment 31 still to ensure there is language around the fact that objectives must be measurable uh, unless the uh, Minister um, can persuade me otherwise uh, when he sums up. Um, 32, again, uh, I, I see the point he makes here. Let me explain why I've included these, this line in. Uh, when the Minister produces his island's plan, it is inevitable that it is uh, public authorities and bodies who will have to deliver much of this plan. Uh, the schedule as it currently stands in the bill in my understanding of the schedule with the listed public authorities, only relates to part three of the bill, and that is the duties in relation to having regard to island communities. Uh, so my interpretation of the bill as it stands, the current schedule is only related to the delivery of part three of the bill, not to part two, which is around the delivery of the island's plan. And for that reason, I felt there was a, a gap there. I think it's important that um, now, also, I, I should add that I have specifically stated that the list of public authorities doesn't need to be in this bill. It just needs to be in the plan. So I'm not asking the minister to include all the public authorities under the jurisdiction of ministers to be on the face of this bill. I'm asking them to be listed in the plan. So there's no ambiguity when the plan is produced which public authorities have to deliver the objective set in that plan. So I, again, I've intentionally left it so that it is, uh, that is uh, incumbent on the plan to do so and addresses the technical issue, the fact that the list in the schedule does not relate to the implementation of the island's plan. I hope that clarifies uh, the reasons for 31 and 32 and I hope the Minister will be supportive of the uh, rationale behind them. And very briefly on some of the other points, um, I think we're happy to accept uh, amendments uh, 1 and two, in the name of the Minister. Uh, they do follow on nicely from the discussion we had around the purpose of the Act. I think these amendments at stage two uh, have a very helpful um, purpose to, uh, uh, to hone in on some of the objectives that the plan should cover around economic, sustainable economic development, health and well-being and community empowerment. I think those are, those are all very welcome additions. Again, at this stage, I think there may be room uh, when we address this at stage three to uh, as a committee uh, or as members to, to tighten that further, but I think that's a welcome addition uh, from where we were before uh, stage two. So I think uh, we'd be happy to support those. I've listened to the arguments uh, from my uh, colleagues, um, uh, Liam McArthur and Tavish Scott. I think they make some very valid points. We, we had a very long conversation about these amendments and I think they all raise some very valid issues around broadband uh, access uh, to islands with ferries and uh, fuel poverty, and I think there's no doubt that these should be included in the plan, but we had a very, also a very long conversation as a committee around being specific on the face of the bill, and, and the problem with creating lists is they become non-exhaustive, and where do you stop? I would then want to include half a dozen other areas that I think should be in the plan, and, and, and my worry has always been throughout this process is that we don't create lists as such, but I wouldn't like to detract from these amendments and the, the reason they were included in the discussion today. I think they're really important issues to be addressed, but for that reason alone, I would be unable to support them uh, because of, of, of the fact that I'm nervous about being specific about what should be in the plan on the face of the primary legislation. Thank you. Jamie, I now call Mike Rumbles uh, to, to speak. Thank you. Can I just say, um, there's a certain nervousness about, about this whole process of the legislation that we're looking at, and then we've got the plan that the minister will come forward with at a later date. and as because of the process, MSPs cannot alter the plan that the minister brings forward. This is a bit like subordinate legislation. So 
Um, the only opportunity MSPs have to, to get something onto the plan is to actually put it into the legislation. Now, I hear what the Minister says, and I can first of all just say, I do not doubt his sincerity. If, when he says ferries will be prominent in the National Islands Plan, I'm certain they will be, he's an honourable man and everything else. But um, So my, my, my comments aren't focused on an individual minister. I mean, there are, there are two ex-transport ministers in the room at the moment. Um, so being a transport minister... Um, I'm not sure how long an individual person will, will be in post. I don't mean to be... I don't... I, if, I, if, I, if I may put on record, actually, I have a very good relationship, I hope, with the Minister for Transport. I think he does a good job, and uh, this is not meant to be personal. What I'm trying to get across is the, is the process that we're involved with here. And because the, the national plan can be reviewed and is to be reviewed quite regularly... Um, the minister, current minister, may not very well be the minister that does the next one. So the only opportunity we have as MSPs is to put it on the face of the bill, and that's the problem. I had finished, but... It is your chance now to say something anyway, Stuart. OK. And could I just, before you do, could I just record that uh, Mike Rumbles is having to leave for a prior engagement with the presiding officer, so... His uh, substitute will be taking over Alex Cole Hamilton. So, Stuart Stevenson, could I ask you then now to speak? Um, very briefly, the point I, I would make in response to Mike Rumbles that Mike Rumbles' political colleague, Ross Finney, when he was in government, um, had it was only when he brought forward the third version of the outdoor access code that came from the Land Reform Act that uh, we finally consented to uh, agreeing it. So there is a process and it does work and there's history of making it work. Um, but I, we'll stick that to all. That's not what, what I really wanted to talk about. I'm briefly going to talk about two of the amendments here. Um, firstly, Liam MacArthur's Amendment 12, and these, these are designed to be helpful rather than destructive uh, observations. I'm just a little bit concerned uh, about any strategy that defines level and standard of ferry services. Now, the reason I do that is that, that I just wonder if we do that, whether we would have seen the innovation that Andrew Banks brought with Pentland Ferries across Pentland Firth, you know, if we prescribed things in a particular way, and indeed for that matter, uh, the, the innovation that Gordon Ross uh, brought at Western Ferries across uh, from, from Gurukh. Um, and also, of course, in only addressing the needs of island communities, I don't see, as I think it would be proper to see, in a ferry strategy, um, a provision for ferries that might uh, go to Campbelltown, which is definitely not on an island, but which in terms of accessibility shares many of the, the same fundamental uh, problems. So I, I just think it may not be the right place uh, to do it. Uh, and, as and, and as further indications of innovation that might not naturally be included in the plan uh, would be hydrofoils. We don't currently have any in Scotland. They're very successful in Norway and a very effective high-speed transport. And, and hovercraft, uh, which notwithstanding that Maurice Corey uh, told us uh, earlier this month uh, that aviation would be coming to uh, the Scottish Parliament, uh, is actually a form of sea transport that requires you to be a commercial pilot uh, rather, than, um, rather than have to maritime. Uh, so that's that, just for... Co the other one is um, uh, uh, Tavish Scott's Amendment 14, um, where I just have a general point that actually the 30 megabits per second, which is presumably meant to refer to download speed, I've got issues about latency and upload speeds, and I also think that actually in a very short space of time we will consider 30 megabits to be rather unambitious, and, and we will be moving towards 300 uh, uh, megabits and indeed gigabit delivery and uh, I, I just don't want to embed um, the, the current target uh, too firmly in our mind when actually we should be moving on to much more ambitious ones. Thank you. Uh, Stuart, uh, John Mason followed by Fulton McGregor. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, I mean, I have to agree with the Minister's argument, and Stuart Stevenson to some extent has reiterated that, that given the nature of this bill, I don't think we want to go into incredible detail. And I have to say that some of these amendments 
I feel go into too much detail, things that will, I think, certainly be uh, in the plan. For example, megabits per second, which we have looked at considerably in this committee, and this would kind of cut across what we've been doing. However, I have to say the exception to that, I feel, is John Finney's amendment number 16, which I don't think goes into a huge amount of detail, but is a big overarching uh, theme. Uh, so I have to say, as things stand, I don't know if uh, John Finney is going to push this or not, but I would be minded to support his amendment uh, if he does uh, move it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Phil McGregor. What can be a point that others have made? I think that Jamie Green made it quite well that, that you know, it, it might not be helpful to go into this at this point, but one of the um, areas that I do think I'd like to, to see, if, I mean, if, if Liam MacArthur's going to withdraw at this stage, um, how any further discussions with the Minister goes is around ferries, and I have perhaps been influenced by a constituent coming to a surgery and giving me the book, Who Pays the Ferryman, which I, before anybody asked me any questions, I've not... Uh, have not read in full yet, but I think that that is something for me specifically that it will affect the island. So I'm hoping that Liam MacArthur will uh, withdraw at this stage, but I'd certainly be interested to see if something could be brought in at stage three that, that includes ferries, particularly on the um, on the, the face of the bill or, or in the plan. And um, in terms of the other amendments that uh, John Finney and others have, have raised, um, for the sake of, I, I think that they've all got a lot of merit, but for the sake of time, as the convener has mentioned, I wanted just to highlight the, the ferry issue specifically. Thank you, uh, Fulton. Uh, I'm now going to ask the Minister to wind up and to move or withdraw your amendment, please, Minister. Uh, of course, I will uh, move uh, my amendments. In my name, just to be brief, if I can, I think that there's a very insightful conversation and contributions that have been made uh, on this group of amendments. Uh, on the three points that Tavish uh, Scott raised, um, absolutely take his point of the importance of the Crown Estate and, and, and devolution of the seabed to local island communities. It's something I hear uh, when, I, when I go there, and it's not just conversations that I have with local authorities at all, but actually the communities on those islands uh, um, absolutely appreciate that that is an important uh, issue to them. Broadband, uh, again, I agree with him, fundamental. Absolutely to island communities, some could argue even more so to island and rural communities than perhaps in, 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 in urban combinations, but I, I won't get into that argument, but certainly fundamental. And on the islands deal, as I say, the tricky part of that is really compelling the UK government to do something in legislation. I'm not sure that would be uh, in, 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 uh, even competent, but nonetheless, uh, you know, good conversations are taking place between the Scottish government and the islands authorities, uh, local authorities, on a potential islands deal, which is incredibly ambitious as, as draft proposals that have come in. Uh, no doubt those conversations will continue, but whenever I can exert some influence, I know my colleagues similarly can exert influence to the UK government uh, to be involved in these discussions, then then uh, they, they uh, then, then we're happy to provide uh, that uh, weight where we can. Only Mark MacArthur's point, uh, I will give him an undertaking uh, around the, the, the ferries, the, the long-term solution to the ferries that uh, he asks uh, of me an update uh, before summer recess uh, as well. Uh, how much progress we've made by then, of course, uh, I don't know, but let's try to, to make uh, some progress and put our shoulder to the wheel uh, on that. But let me give him the assurances that uh, he seeks. I would say probably more of an acute issue on Orkney than perhaps as uh, in Shetland with the age of some of the vessels on the internal ferries, but let's try to make sure that we work towards that, and I'll give him the, the, the assurances that he looks for. Um, and I thought the future-proofing point was an important uh, one that Mike Rumbles was making, although he seems to have some insight into my future political career that <laughs> I don't even have, but uh, I thought the future-proofing point was an important one. I think that's actually precisely why we shouldn't have uh, these issues on the face of the bill, because changing primary legislation, as we all know, is not an easy task. Uh, and therefore, perhaps doing that through the National Islands Plan would be the most appropriate. Um, similarly, for fuel poverty, on, on Lee MacArthur's point, <coughs> I will uh, attempt to arrange a, a meeting between him, myself, Kevin, and him uh, ahead of stage three, as he asks. I think that would be uh, sensible. On John Finney's point, I think there are issues well made, particularly on the invasive, invasive species uh, that uh, I've, uh, I, I have had conversations with local authorities on. Uh, but I hope he also sees my point around uh, uh, the face of the bill probably not being the best place, but let's have a conversation before stage three, perhaps, around uh, where, how we can incorporate that absolutely into the National Islands Plan and where he can be um, reassured uh, that, that would be given the prominence it's due. So I would, again, urge um, my colleagues uh, not to, not to uh, push uh, their amendments, but work with me in stage three, uh, ahead of stage three, to see if I can give them the reassurances they require on uh, Jamie Green's just to finish uh, convener. 
Um, uh, again, I would uh, uh, ask him uh, that. Uh, well, I'm happy to accept uh, if he's uh, the, the amendment 32 around uh, the lists on public uh, authorities. Uh, the plan. I don't think it's necessary. I'm not even convinced this will have the effect that he wishes it to have. But nonetheless, um, I, I don't think it's an issue uh, that I have too much uh, concern over. Uh, again, on 31, um, I don't think it's necessary. I do think there's some difficulties on measuring some outcomes. I do absolutely believe in um, being able to measure them, being able to monitor them, being able to assess them, happy to work with them before stage three to see how we do that. But there's some high level objectives that I think are just difficult uh, to, to, to necessarily be able to measure in an empirical way. Um, but uh, so therefore I'd ask them not to press uh, that uh, amendment, but work with me in advance of stage three. Thank you. That was as quick uh, as I could go. Sorry? That was as quick as I could go, Camille. Okay. Thank you, Minister. We therefore come to a question, and the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore would call amend Amendment 30 in the name of John Mason, already debated with Amendment 10. John Mason, to move or not move? Not moved. Uh, the member's not moved. Does any member present object to the amendment being withdrawn? No. Sorry? Just move on to oh, sorry. I've got it wrong in my rush to move forward. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. It was nice to be corrected by you. So, therefore, we move on to the question, uh, sorry, that Amendment 2, in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1. Minister, to formally move. Formally move. So, I call Amendment 2A, in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with Amendment 1. Colin Smith, to move or not move? Uh, move. Okay, the question therefore is Amendment 2A be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Therefore, sorry, Minister, to press or withdraw Amendment 2. Okay, the question therefore is Amendment 2 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're therefore, we are agreed. Therefore, can we call Amendment 11 in the name of Tavish Scott, already debated with Amendment 1? Tavish Scott, to move or not move? Not move, Convener. Thank you. Just move straight on to the next one. I therefore call Amendment 12 in the name of Liam MacArthur, already debated with Amendment 1. Liam MacArthur to move or not move? The base is what we said, not moved. Not moved. Therefore, uh, is that one's not no, sorry. I therefore call Amendment 13 in the name of Liam MacArthur, already debated with Amendment 1. Liam MacArthur, move or not move? Again, on the basis of the undertaking is not moved. Okay. I therefore call the Amendment 14 in the name of Tavish Scott, already debated with Amendment 1. Tavish Scott, to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. I therefore call Amendment 15 in the name of Tavish Scott, already debated with Amendment 1. Tavish Scott, to move or not move? Not move, Convener. Thank you. I therefore call Amendment 16 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 1. John Finney to move or not move? Uh, in light of the Minister's comments, I won't move. Really. Thank you. Uh, now move to uh, call Amendment 31 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 1. Jamie Green to move or not move? To not move. Not moved. I therefore call Amendment 32 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 1. Jamie Green to move or not move? Moved. Okay, the question therefore is Amendment 32 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. We are agreed. The question therefore now is that Section 3 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Now we call Amendment 17 in the name of Gail Ross, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Gail Ross to move Amendment 17 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, during the committee's evidence sessions, um, six local authorities with island interest did make a strong case to be included as statutory consultees uh, for the preparation of the National Islands Plan. This um, amendment is very straightforward, in line with the recommendation of the committee, um, requires Scottish ministers to consult the six local authorities as listed in the schedule of the bill in the preparation of the National Islands Plan. Um, and also uh, from my own constituency, 
the Highland Council met on the 8th of March and showed support for, amongst other things, the inclusion of the six local authorities with island interests as statutory consultees to the plan. Um, if other local authorities were to be added to the schedule in future, then Amendment 17 would also mean that they would have to be consulted as well. And in this way, this amendment allows for the future proofing in a way that um, Peter Chapman's Amendment 33 in the group end does not. Uh, I also believe that my amendment does work better than amendments 34 and 35 from Jamie Green, which does seem to include all local authorities, um, rather than just island local authorities, but I'll uh, wait to hear what Jamie Green has to, to say about the rationale for that. Um, as a consequence of Amendment 17, I've also put forward a technical amendment, Amendment 18, that adjusts Section 41A1 to make it clear that persons other than local authorities that represent the interests of island communities must also be consulted. Um, I will be supporting Amendment 19 in the name of John Mason, which inserts island communities into the consultation on the National Island Plan. I will also support Amendment 36, put forward by John Mason, which seeks to include natural heritage in the matters that ministers must have regard to in preparation of the plan. I feel this is a welcome addition. Um, I will also support Amendment 3, put forward by the minister, to ensure that the linguistic heritage of our island communities must be considered in the plan. Uh, Jamie Green's Amendment 40 I'm generally supportive of as well to provide information on the annual report about the actions that ministers are taking on the outcomes. Um, I will also listen to the other points of the other amendments in his group, but I don't see that they're necessary, but I'll wait, as I say, to hear. Uh, finally, I will also support Amendment 4 from Fulton McGregor, which ensures that ministers must bring forward the annual report within three months from the end of the reporting year. I think that's very reasonable. Um, I move Amendment 17. Thank you. I now call on Peter Chapman to speak to Amendment 33 and the other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. I mean, I accept that much of what I have to say here is, is already been uh, said by uh, is said in Gail Ross's uh, amendment. Um, I've got another list here, so I, I, I suspect Stuart Stevenson won't, won't be uh, overly enthralled with that because he, he didn't like the list last time round. But uh, I think it, it just adds clarity, and I think it's it's important that the the, the six island uh, authorities are statutory consultees. That's basically what I'm trying to achieve by 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 this amendment. Um, I'll leave Jamie Green to speak to his amendments, uh, which I will be supporting. John Mason's Amendment 19 I, I can support. Um, and the Minister's uh, Amendment 3 also I can support. M amendment 37 in the name of John Mason, um, I, I, I can't uh, agree to that. Um, and I, for the life of me, I can't remember why, but that's... Uh, <laughs> That's, that's, that, that's, 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 <laughs> yeah, it says it there, I've, I've, I've been, I've been, I've been, I've been helped out by my neighbour here and he isn't even a member of the committee, so there you go. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, yeah, we, <laughs> yeah, we need to question the term, including inhabited islands, should it not be uninhabited islands, as this bill more generally refers to those which are inhabited and uninhabited. I'm not sure that makes it any clearer, so to, to be honest, we'll, we'll move on. Um, Amendment 38, Colin Smith, again, uh, um, it, it's, it's similar to John Mason, so we're not happy with that one. And where are we now? Uh, Fulton's, uh, I can support. Fulton McGregor, Amendment 4, I can support. Thank you. I'm pleased to say, Peter, that John Mason actually understood why the, the question you raised, so no doubt he'll cover that when it gets to him. But the next person to speak is Jamie Green to speak to Amendment 34 and the others in his group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, I'll briefly uh, cover uh, Amendment 33 in the name of my colleague, Pete Chapman, to support. I think listing these uh, specific island authorities as uh, statutory consultees is, is important. Um, and I therefore will, will support that. I'll move on to my amendments in this grouping. Uh, 34, uh, uh, just uh, checking where we're at here. Uh, yes, I, I see, I see Garros's point. Um, I, I think the purpose behind this was to include local authorities. 
um, as part of this consultation process, I think there's a general feeling throughout all members, and I think there's variances in the wording of how we achieve this, um, and perhaps some conflicting wording in, 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 in the various amendments here, but there's a general sense of purpose here that we feel that it's important that not just local authorities, but island communities themselves must be part of this consultation process. And that's feedback we took very strongly from our, our visits to islands. And I think that's reflected on <coughs> in what you see here today. That, that's the purpose of 34 and 35. Um, uh, yes, I will. Um, but you, you talk about um, island communities and absolutely nobody here has got any argument with including island communities. It's just the fact that it says local authorities, which would encompass all local authorities, not just those with islands or island local authorities. Thank you, Jeremy Green. Yes, I, I, I take on board that point. I think in terms of the technicality of the wording, it, it could have been tidier at, at this stage. Um, we were up against the wire in terms of uh, amendment deadlines. So um, I think that there was a purpose there, and, and I'm happy to reflect on that. If there's a way we could uh, strengthen the wording to include the relevant island authorities, I'd be happy to, to look at that as we move forward. And I actually really support uh, Amendment 19. It's an important point. It's not just local authorities. Who are the voices of islands? Well, I think members of island communities themselves uh, I, uh, those voices must be heard and for that reason I, I think that's an excellent uh, addition. Uh, if I could jump to 39 uh, briefly um, this it, is a technical tidy up um, uh, the, the plan must be laid uh, to Parliament on a day which the Parliament is sitting. It doesn't explicitly state that at the moment in, in the Bill and I think that's important that the plan for example is not published the day after summer recess begins, not that the Minister would ever dream of such a thing, um, but that ensuring that it is uh, delivered to Parliament on a day which is sitting, it for example allows the opportunity for urgent questions to come up in the Chamber or other ways of scrutinising the plan in any manner that we see fit. So it's, again, it's not been too, too prescriptive on how we should scrutinise the plan, but it does make sure that we, we get it in on a day that Parliament can discuss it appropriately. 40, um, I think, and I welcome Gil Ross's comments on that. At the moment, the uh, bill only says that the uh, the report will talk about the extent to which outcomes have improved since the previous reporting year. Uh, now, that's, that's wonderful, and I hope outcomes do improve. Um, but the government should also be accountable in the sense that it should lay to Parliament details of where outcomes have not improved. And this small amendment does that very purpose. Um, I, I, I can't imagine government would ever want to avoid uh, uh, publishing negative news or a regression in any of its uh, outcomes. So um, I, I hope this strengthens the Minister's ability to be uh, quite forthcoming and frank about which objectives have or have not been met or have, or have not improved since the previous year. That, that was the, the rationale behind that and I hope I have the committee's support on that. And the final one is uh, 42, uh, again around um, uh, the wording uh, uh, on page three of the bill. Uh, at the moment, it says any other matters which the Scottish ministers consider appropriate. I think the inclusion of the financial implications of, 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 of the, the bill are important. If we find after a year there has been significant effect on uh, local authorities or public authorities' ability to deliver the objectives of the plan financially or uh, the mitigation uh, uh, requirements to um, uh, help uh, local authorities make decisions when they have due regard to island communities. I think it's important that the, that the Minister is, is honest with Parliament as to what the potential financial consequence of that may be. And again, that wasn't explicit in the bill as it's drafted. I'll, I'll stop there, convener. Thank you. Uh, I'd now ask John Mason to speak to Amendment 19 and the other amendments in the group. Uh, thanks, convener. And yeah, I'll focus my attention on the three amendments that I've put forward, 19, 36 and 37. I think 19, I'm picking up positive uh, vibes already. I think the reason for 19, it, it did come out of the committee report, uh, where in preparation scrutiny of the plan, section 41A2, uh, the, for, on consultation, the ministers are required to consult such persons as they consider likely to be affected by the proposals contained in the plan. And I think there was a general feeling that that was just a little bit too vague. So the intention uh, of this amendment is to uh, beef that up somewhat by adding in including members of island communities and other persons. So I'm hoping that that will uh, not be contentious. 
A on 36, it is the addition of natural heritage in uh, B, following on uh, again in um, section 4, where currently it says have regard to the distinctive geographical and cultural characteristics of each of the, area, each of the islands effectively. And the suggestion would be that we add in natural heritage there, so distinctive geographical, natural heritage and cultural characteristics, uh, just to be sure that we are including uh, everything to do with the natural heritage. Natural heritage itself is defined in statute under the Natural Heritage Scotland Act 1991, which uh, means, quote, the flora and fauna of Scotland, its geological and physiological features, its nature, beauty and amenity, uh, end of quote. So um, the future plan uh, should cover that and things that have been already been mentioned, like non-invasive, uh, non sorry, non-native species. And um, you know we've got examples, uh, natural heritage also linking in with the economy. For example, the sea eagles in Mull uh, thought to bring in something like five million pounds a year to the local economy. Uh, I think 38 Colin Smith's uh, amendment is very similar to mine. Uh, we probably don't need both. Uh, but uh, we certainly want uh, one of them. And thirdly then, uh, 37 public interest. Uh, so that, um, again, and this is still obviously in the consultation area, at the moment we're talking very much about uh, considering the interests of island communities, absolutely correct. Uh, such persons as would be uh, affected, absolutely correct. Uh, and then regard to the characteristics of the areas inhabited by island communities. Absolutely correct. But I think we could, I think there's a principle here, we could add in uh, this bit about public interest. It's not just any public interest, it's not totally vague. It's having regard to the public interest in the environmental, economic and social characteristics of islands, including inhabited islands. Now that was uh, Mr Chapman's point. Should it have said both uninhabited and inhabited? I, th I think because the assumption throughout most of the bill is about inhabited islands, um, I'm, we're using the term here islands uh, to include all islands, uh, but absolutely including uninhab in, sorry, inhabited islands. And uh, I accept that could be worded differently, um, but that, that was the wording we uh, came up with. And I, th I think my point here, and I believe quite strongly in this, uh, is that islands are not just important to island communities. I believe that islands are important to us as a nation. And I'm a city dweller and I like living in the city, uh, but I, I love the, our islands and I love going to our islands. And uh, I think this amendment would bring in here a wider public interest, albeit specified on environmental, economic and social characteristics. Uh, but I think it would help to emphasize that we as a nation have a commitment to our islands, not just the people that live on them. Thank you. John, I now call on the Minister to speak to Amendment 3 and the other amendments in the group. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. I will speak to Amendment 3 in my name uh, first and then move on to the other amendments. In the group, in its Stage 1 report, the committee called on the Scottish Government to consider an extension to the provisions of the Bill, so that in addition to having regard to the distinctive geographical and cultural characteristics of the islands, we could also give due regard to linguistic heritage. Two, uh, we indeed uh, recognise the importance of, of the linguistic heritage of Scotland's island communities um, and uh, the bill already uses the expression cultural characteristics which covers a, a range of masses including uh, Gaelic cultural traditions of the Hebrides and indeed the Scandinavian heritage of Orkney and Shetland. But I accept the committee's suggestion that clarification might be helpful so I brought forward Amendment 3 to be clear that in preparing the National Islands Plan the Scottish Ministers must have regard to linguistic heritage. Um, turning to the other amendments, I'm happy to support Gail Ross's Amendment 17 and 18. Uh, through the Ministerial Island Strategic Group, I've developed a, a strong and, and hopefully constructive partnership with the six island local authorities um, and the local authorities with islands. Uh, as stated in my response to the committee's Stage 1 report, um, the six local authorities have helped us and assisted us with the development of this bill ahead of its introduction. I always envisage that through their participation in the islands, strategic group that they would continue to play an active role in helping us deliver uh, the Bill's provisions and indeed the guidance. Amendments 17 and 18 will ensure that all six local authorities are listed as statutory consultees for the National Islands Plan and uh, very much uh, welcome them. Uh, in support of those amendments lodged by Gail Ross, as others have already said, 
I don't necessarily see then the need for Amendment 33 uh, lodged by Peter Chapman, nor indeed Amendments 34 and 35 lodged by Jamie Green. Amendment 33 from Peter Chapman uh, is not future-proofed in the same way that the amendments put forward by Gail Ross uh, are. So therefore I ask him not to move his amendment. Uh, and amendments 34 and 35 from Jamie Green uh, add consultation with all local authorities who are representing island communities or affected by proposals. Uh, while I think it's useful to specifically identify the six island authorities in the schedule, adding all local authorities here uh, is not required. If the member has concerns about other local authorities, I would note that they're already covered in section 4, subsection 1a, uh, as under the normal rules of statutory interpretation, a local authority is a type of legal person. I would therefore ask him not to move these amendments. I'm happy to support Amendment 19 put forward by John Mason. The amendment is a simple and effective means of highlighting that island communities must be consulted in the preparation of the plan. Also happy to support Amendment 36 put forward by John Mason. Some of our island landscapes and habitats are truly world class and it's right the National Island Plan has regards to our natural heritage. I am intrigued by Amendment 37 from John Mason. I listened carefully to what he had to say on that, but I'm, I'm still not entirely convinced that it works as intended, not least as it refers to, as we've already said, uninhabited islands, which we discussed in an earlier group. But I understand, I think, what he's trying to do. So uh, again, can I, in an attempt to be helpful, ask him not to press his amendment today, but let's work together alongside my officials to see what can be done to give effect to what I understand uh, and I think he's trying to do. Um, and uh, of course, if he's satisfied with that, then we'll come forward with uh, another amendment. If not, of course, he. I could come back at stage three, so uh, can I give him that offer? Uh, because I'm not entirely clear, uh, and I think there are some unintended consequences to his public interest amendment. Um, I don't think the Amendment 38 from Colin Smith uh, is required if we support Amendment 36 from John Mason. It does essentially the same thing, uh, and I ask members to support Amendment 36, uh, and, and therefore for Colin Smith not to move the amendment uh, in his name. Amendment 39 from Jamie Green requires the final National Islands Plan to be laid before the Scottish Parliament on a day which Parliament is sitting, uh, which effectively means uh, not in recess. Uh, I assume the members worried, of course, will attempt to sneak out uh, during uh, the recess when members uh, aren't looking. Unfortunately, uh, what the amendment could do is it could mean that we may have to delay laying the plan until Parliament comes back from whatever recess uh, got in the way. Uh, indeed, we'd still have an obligation under Section 4, subsection 4, to publish the plan as soon as reasonably possible and practicable. Uh, whenever we lay and publish the final plan, it will be there for members to consider and de debate uh, should they wish. Uh, section 4 builds in 40, uh, a 40 day parliamentary period after laying the draft proposed plan before the final plan uh, is made after that. I wouldn't want to delay laying and publication of the final plan. It just, I'm going to finish this a small point, and then, of course, I'll take his intervention. I just make the point that I completely understand uh, where he's coming from. We've talked a lot about future-proofing, so as reasonable as a minister might be or a government might be, uh, perhaps we need to um, future-proof that uh, as well. And therefore, I'm more than happy uh, to have a discussion uh, with the Minister for Parliamentary Business. It would be for the SPCB, of course, to have a conversation around um, an appropriate debate around the National Islands Plan. Um, uh, of course, when, obviously, when Parliament uh, is sitting, I would also make the point that the collaborative approach we're looking to take with the Islands Plan will mean that there will be essentially no surprises for any members of what is in that plan. I am, of course, now happy to take Jamie Green's intervention. Thank the Minister for taking my intervention. So just, can the Minister just clarify, uh, as it stands at the moment, theoretically, the Minister could lay the plan uh, at the beginning of summer <coughs> recess, for example, uh, at which point Parliament will not uh, fully address it until we come back. With regards to the draft plan versus the final plan, can you just clarify the timeline for that? Because I think what I'm trying to achieve here by saying it must, at the very least, be submitted on a parliamentary sitting day is that at least it has been formally presented uh, to Parliament whilst it sits. So that, for example, then would give MSPs the summer recess to review it before it's... Uh, or, or, or would the, would a, could a draft be issued at that point, but then would the 40-day deadline occur during the recess? I'm a bit confused the term, in terms of the timeline and how it's currently drafted. Um, it is, uh, I can confirm, 40 days, um, beginning with the day in which the plan is laid before uh, the Scottish Parliament. My understanding is that it's 40 
uh, sitting days, but again, I'm happy to work with the member uh, to try to give him, uh, get him further clarification uh, right. of that. Um, but I, I can write to the committee to clarify uh, that. But what I would say to the member uh, is, you know, um, you know, I think our members of the opposition, uh, if nobody else, I think would uh, you know pull us, be the first ones rightly to pull us up if we attempted to sneak out something as. Uh, is as important uh, and, and high up our agenda as the National Islands Plan, but it didn't get the appropriate scrutiny. I don't expect any, uh, I have to say, uh, as I say, any surprises with the National Islands Plan in the sense that we've all discussed and we all know uh, some of the main issues that will be in that plan that we hear from the island communities uh, regularly. So, uh, theoretically speaking, uh, yes, uh, you know, a, a draft could be laid at the start of uh, just before summer recess. Uh, and then perhaps uh, it won't uh, get scrutiny until we uh, come back. Uh, but I'm happy to work with the member to try to avoid that from being the case. So I'm happy to work with them before and ahead of stage three to look to try to devise a timetable uh, that takes into account parliamentary recesses and appropriate uh, levels of, of, of scrutiny. Um, moving on, just to conclude... Uh, Convener Amendment 40 from Jamie Green uh, asked Scottish ministers to set out the steps that we will take uh, where an outcome is identified in the plan that has not improved. Uh, I'm not sure if this works with his previous Amendment 31, which refers to objectives necessarily being measurable uh, and not outcomes. But I understand that Mr Green is seeking to achieve here. It certainly has some merit. Um, where an outcome or objective is not being met, the Scottish Minister should absolutely consider uh, what they should do to seek to change that. So I'd ask uh, Mr Green not to press Amendment 40 at this stage, but on the basis, of course, I'll ask officials, uh, and I too will consider this more uh, liaise with him before stage three, uh, to ensure that if considered appropriate, a suitably worded amendment in the same vein uh, can be drafted. Amendment 42 is also from Jamie Green. Uh, I think the amendment is far too broad. I ask Scottish governments to report on any financial implication arising as a result of the Act, as the Act will apply to a very broad range of organisations. I don't think it would be an entirely realistic requirement uh, for information. Uh, I then just turn to Amendment 4, brought forward by Fulton uh, McGregor, requiring the annual report to be laid within three months after the end of the reporting year, conscious of the Parliament's focus on the desirability for transparency, clarity and accountability. I'm happy to support it. Uh, from a Scottish Government perspective, uh, it has always anticipated the annual report on the plan's progress it would be published and laid before Parliament in a timely fashion following the end of the reporting year. And I think I will just conclude there. Thank you, Mr. I now call on Colin Smith to speak to Amendment 38 and the other amendments in the group. Colin. Thank you very much. Very briefly, uh, Amendment 30 is very similar to uh, John Mason's uh, Amendment 36. It does add natural environment to, um, to, to, to the bill. Uh, this was a, an issue that I raised during Stage 1 debate, um, natural heritage, sorry, not natural environment, uh, during Stage 1 debate, um, and it's something I feel quite passionate about. However, if uh, we vote for Amendment 36, then I won't, I won't push this amendment when it comes to that stage. Thank you very much, uh, Colin. And I call on Fulton McGregor to speak to Amendment 4 and the other amendments in the group. Fulton. Just speaking to my uh, amendment uh, first, and I'll, I'll, I'll be as brief as I can. Section 5 of the Bill places a duty on ministers to prepare and publish an annual progress report that will provide information on the improvement of outcomes for island communities that has occurred over the previous year, and also information on how ministers have complied with Section 7 island proofing duty. The bill currently provides the report must be produced as soon as reasonably practical. However, to help assist with the tracking pro of progress on the annual report, we as a committee made a recommendation to put a time limit on when the annual report should be published by the Scottish Ministers. Amendment 4 in my name ensures that the Scottish Ministers must publish and lay before Parliament the annual report by three months after the end of the reporting year. I believe it is an appropriate length of time for Ministers to produce the information. Anything shorter and there is a risk of the information not being available and any longer it could be out of date. Um, I will be supporting the amendments put forward by Gil Ross uh, and the Minister and also support John Mason's Natural Heritage Amendment. As others have said, I'm not sure of the need for amendments of 39 and 42 from Jamie Green, but I do see the benefits in Amendment 40. I will note the Minister's calls um, to do further work with that before Stage 3. Thanks. Thank you very much, Fulton. I now call on Richard Lyle, followed by Stuart Stevenson. Yes, uh, because of the uh, time factor, I'll be brief. Um, Amendment 34-35, basically, Jamie Green has said slightly been uh, badly drafted, and I, and I would ask him 
to withdraw away. With the great, greatest respect, and, and my constituency, I don't have an island unless it's maybe in the middle of a lake, a lake um, somewhere. Um, so, basically, um, in regard to uh, the other uh, amendments in the group, the point, I would take on board the points that uh, the Minister is making. ask the members to reflect. Thank you, uh, Richard. Stuart, you're next. Just a brief comment on uh, Amendment 39, Jamie, 9, Jamie Green's name. Um, the, what he's proposing is in conflict with standing orders at 14.1.3 of the Parliament, which states the report or other document may be laid before Parliament at any time uh, at the office when the clerk, uh, office of the clerk is open. Uh, so therefore, we would have to look at what the standing orders say, and I don't know how we would change the standing orders to conform to this. So that's our procedural point. The other point is, I think the best day for laying this particular uh, material is actually the last day before summer recess. Now, the reason I say that is because then all of us can go and consult with our <coughs> constituents over the summer recess, a two-month period, on the contents of it before the 40 days parliamentary sitting days it starts to operate. So actually, contrary to the argument put forward, the best day to lay it is the last day before recess starts. It, but, or, or the day after, for that matter. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, John Finney, and then I'm going to ask Gail Ross to wind up. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. I'd just like to speak briefly on, on the, the Minister's um, Amendment number three there, and I'm grateful that it reflects the stage one report recommendation of the committee. A, 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 a very uh, um, deep interest in uh, our linguistic heritage, and I'm grateful that you mentioned the, the Norse heritage of the North Isles. I just wonder in relation to this, in the, the relation to the, the plan and other plans, Minister, I mean, clearly there will have to be a regard to a, one plan that's in place for uh, regarding our, our linguistic heritage, and that's the National Gaelic Language Plan. I've had various representations made to me. I wonder, and, and you're in a position perhaps to allay some of the concerns here, could you confirm that, for instance, Borna Gaelic would be consulted in the preparation and would play some role in the assess, subsequent assessment of the island's plan, please? Thank you very much indeed. One <laughs> time. Uh, John, John is, is, is that you concluded? That's me concluded. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, for Gail Ross to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, we have had a really thorough discussion, I think, on all the amendments, and there are many points to consider. I would say um, Jamie Green's uh, say, uh, Amendment 39, if we were going to put it on the last day before recess, it still is a sitting day of Parliament, which is uh, very interesting. But um, I, to go back to my own amendments, um, I do feel that um, it is uh, stronger than Peter Chapman's 33 because it does allow for the list of statutory local authorities to be in the schedule, which allows for future proofing, as you know, I said, and the minister did say as well. So I would ask him um, not to press that, but I press my amendments. Thank you uh, for that. Now, therefore, we move to a question, and the question is that Amendment 17 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, I therefore want to call Amendment 33 in the name of Peter Chapman, already debated with Amendment uh, 17. Peter Chapman, move or not move? Not move. OK. I therefore want to call Amendment 18 in the name of Gail Ross, already debated with Amendment 17. Gail Ross, to move or not move? Move. The question, therefore, is Amendment be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore want to call Amendment 34, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 17. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Not move. OK, thank you. I therefore want to call Amendment 19 in the name of John Mason, already debated with Amendment 17. Uh, John Mason, to move or not move? Moved. Uh, the question, therefore, is Amendment 19 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. We are agreed. Therefore, I want to call Amendment 35 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 17. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Not move, convener. Not moved. Thank you. <clears throat> I therefore want to call a name, Amendment 36 in the name of John Mason, already debated with Amendment 17. John Mason, to move or not move? Moved. 
The question, therefore, is Amendment 36 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 3 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 17. Minister, can you move that formally? Moved. The question, therefore, is Amendment 3 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore call Amendment 37 in the name of John Mason already debated with Amendment 17. John Mason to move or not move? Moved. Moved. Therefore, the question is Amendment 37 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. I call a division. Those in favour, uh, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise your hands. Abstain. There are three votes for amendments, seven votes against. There's one abstention. Therefore, the member is uh, the, it is not agreed. Yeah. So we're on to 38. Yes. I therefore call amendment 38 in the name of Colin Smith, already debated with amendment 17. Colin Smith to move or not move? In light of the support for amendment 36, say it not move. Thank you. I therefore call Amendment 39 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 17. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Uh, if the Minister will work with me at stage three, I won't move this amendment. OK, and that is not moved, therefore. The question we have at this stage is Section 4 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Right, I'd now like to call Amendment 40 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 17. Jamie Green, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 40 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I therefore would like to call Amendment 41 in the name of John Mason, already debated with Amendment 10. John Mason to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I therefore call Amendment 42 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 17. Jamie Green to move or not move? Moved. The question therefore is that Amendment 42 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Oh. Yes. Uh, there is a division. Uh, I therefore, all those in favour, please raise your hand. Those against? And, one, and those abstentions, one. Therefore, there are four votes for, there are six votes against, there is one abstention. <laughs> That amendment is not agreed. I therefore call Amendment 4 in the name of Fulton McGregor, already debated with Amendment 17. Fulton McGregor to move or not move? Move. Thank you. Uh, the question, therefore, is Amendment 4 be agreed? <coughs> are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, the question, therefore, that Section 5 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 6 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I'm afraid uh, that is as far as that we are able to go today. We will pick up next week where we've left off today. Therefore, amendments remaining to the remaining sections of the bill can still be lodged. The deadline for doing so is at 12 noon tomorrow, the 22nd of March. That concludes today's business, and I now close the meeting.